The opening round of the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe powered by AWS Sprint Cup is here at Brands Hatch. We're in the sunshine. We're on the full Grand Prix circuit. And this is a proper old school circuit. It's got ups and downs. It's got barriers close to the edge of the circuit. It's a real driver's track and it's one that can bite. There is no margin for error. It's also relatively narrow, and that's put the onus on the teams throughout qualifying. A good grid position is absolutely essential as we get set for the first 60-minute blast of a whole new season of GT3 Sprint Racing. Welcome to the Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS Sprint Cup, where star drivers in supercar brands go head-to-head -head in the fiercest GT competition. So, how does it work? There are five events with two races at each. The races last for one hour and each car has two drivers. So there's a mandatory pit stop in a window between 25 and 35 minutes of the race in which every team must change drivers and change all four tires. Those pit stops can be done as fast as possible in the pro and silver classes, putting the emphasis on the pit crew as races can be won or lost in the pits. All the cars run to international GT3 regulations, but then divided by driver grading. The pro class is for the real stars. Many are manufacturer paid drivers, and the winners are most likely to come from here. The silver cup is for the young guns, up and coming but less experienced or successful, while Pro-Am is just that, an amateur racer partnered by a pro as the gun for hire. There are 26 cars from six different brands, and it means there are battles throughout the field in 60 minutes of high-octane drama. So who do we look for for a win this weekend? Charles Weirds partners Dries Van Thor, and the pair of them have won the Sprint Cup for the last two seasons. Once more aboard a WRT Audi, they're looking for three in a row. It's a really special track. Uh, it's not often you have such uh, elevation changes, uh, but uh, no, I really like it. It's old school, so you don't have the right to a mistake. So yeah, it's going to be nice. I enjoy it. We know it's a good track for the Mercedes, so we'll try to, to be on, in the mix with them and uh, yeah, just try to gather as much points as we can. And we had again a great start of the year here in Imola in Endurance where we won the race and uh, we'll just try to keep up that form. WRT is for sure one of the best team on the grid and it's uh, for sure a lot of pleasure to drive with them and uh, let's try to, to make another success with them. Another key brand represented on the grid is McLaren and the 720S was really quick around Brands Hatch last season. Qualifying this year, life is a little bit more challenging. The driver, Holly Wilkinson. Yeah, we're looking good. I think the car went from strength to strength last year, having our highest ever Spa 24 finish and nearly had our highest ever race finish and first race win here, but unfortunately that didn't quite go to plan. So we'll be looking to build off the back of that this weekend and see if we can get her up on the podium. Brand number three, step forward, Porsche. The dynamic motorsport team fields two cars, and one is hustled along by the Belgian driver, Adrian Delina. He's back in harness after injuring himself at Masano last year, and he's up for the challenge. I mean, luckily we were at Nordschleife last week, so it's a little bit of a similar track uh, in terms of, let's say, the runoff areas and how the, the constellation of the track is. Um, I think some simulator running. We've all been on the sim in the team, so we have an idea of where we're going, and now it's about dialing in the car and making sure that we have the best package we can. I mean, ideally, we will be somewhere in the middle of the points. That's what we're aiming for. We finished the season really strongly last year. We had a close podium result in Zandvoort, had the car not failed on us. So I think we have a good package uh, between the drivers as well as the team and the car. So hopefully we'll put it all together in time for the race. Jules Grunon was a star two weeks ago in the UK in the opening British GT Championship round, and here he is at another good old school circuit for the Acodis ASP Mercedes team, looking for a victory. Those UK tracks are amazing. I had so much fun in Utland Park two weeks ago. It's the same track, you know, it's uh, grass and then straight the wall, so you need to respect the place, go step by step to the limit, closer to closer. And uh, yeah, it's, it's an amazing place. Last year went well. We did P3 with Razman Numbare School, my teammate last year. But like you said, it was an eventful race. So let's try to stay out of trouble this year, do great qualification, and then uh, we try to send it for the race. A potential winning team in the Silver Cup is Sky Tempesta Racing. They've switched from Ferrari to Mercedes for this year. And that poses new challenges for Eddie Cheever and Chris Froggart. You know, everyone knows the Sprint Championship is extremely competitive, like the Endurance, but here 
there's even less margin for error. The races are only an hour long, so you know, you've got to make the absolute most of it. And it, it probably a more aggressive style of racing here. New car, so yeah, absolutely a lot to learn in the new car, and we're still getting to grips with it, but I feel over time we'll definitely get there, and here at sort of my home track I feel quite comfortable, so fingers crossed we have good pace. Another car to keep an eye to, indeed another battle to keep an eye on, is in Pro-Am, where this McLaren of Garage 59 should start. Miguel Ramos is a perennial racer in the championship, joined by newcomer Dean McDonald, the Scotsman, eager to go racing. Yeah, I think everyone enjoys this place, don't they? When you go out in the GP, um, yeah, it's great to drive, and yeah, done a few races here already, so a bit of experience. So. I was in this car in British GT a few years back, um, and actually with Garage 59, the first year I raced, so yeah, a few familiar faces, and yeah, look forward to getting started again with them. I think it will be competitive, working out last year at this race, uh, McCarm was on pole, um, so yeah, um, if all goes well, I think hopefully we should be there as well. Remember too that these European races make up part of the global Fanatec GT World Challenge powered by AWS. The brands scoring points in Europe, America, Australasia and Asia. Currently it's Audi that has the advantage over Mercedes AMG with Porsche in third place. But two good results here in Europe this weekend could radically shake up the order. So the grid here at Brands Hatch is formed and we are looking forward hugely to this first Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe powered by AWS Sprint Cup opener. It is a 25 strong field because we are sadly without one car. I'll come to that in a few moments. Uh, John Watson and David Addison are trackside and down on the grid is Gemma Scott and she is with the man most people have come to see Gemma. It's Valentino Rossi. Valley, if we can just interrupt you for a moment. Wonderful to have you here. A sea of yellow around Brands Hatch. It's a real pleasure to see so many fans for you. But your first time here, how are you enjoying the circuit? Yes, yeah, the, the, the circuit is, uh, is fantastic. Uh, it's, uh, it's very particular, very fast, uh, and it's, uh, it's good. And uh, thanks to all the fans, because uh, here in the UK, I have always a big, big support in all my career, and also today. So it's great to see, to see all the people. Absolutely. And of course, we're here at 17th on the grid. There's a bit of work to do, maybe a little bit daunting into Paddock Hill Bend. I don't know. Don't think what's mean. Well, there's a lot of work to do and perhaps a lot of cars yeah, in front of you and anticipation. Yeah, they, they are my friend in front. They, <laughs> they let me pass. <laughs> You've done a deal with them. Yes. <laughs> what's it like to, for the fans that, that don't know this circuit either to go into Paddock Field Bend, that drop down as a driver? It yes. must feel quite incredible. Yes, it's incredible because uh, so the track is very narrow, don't have a lot of curb, and also you have a lot, a lot of up and down. Uh, so exit from the first corner when you go down and you come up is like you remain without breath, you know? And especially you have a lot of blind corner and, uh, and it's, uh, it's very difficult. You need to take, uh, to take the, right, uh, the right point uh, to entry. And your target for today? Uh, good question. Try to recover some uh, position and we see. Thank you very much. Have a great race. Thanks, Valley. The sea of yellow is absolutely right because everywhere you look there are Rossi fans. They were here on Friday even though the cars weren't on track. They were trying to get a glimpse of the great man and an autograph. Uh, and we're going to have this John Watson all season. The Rossi effect is just immense. So the grid now being cleared. Elise de Pau starts on pole position with Jules Gounon alongside Matthew Drudy and Timur Bogoslavsky share row two ahead of Charles Witt and Aurelien Panis. Gilles Magnus had a spin into the gravel yesterday but starts seventh alongside Peter Scotthorst with Simon Gachet and Thomas Drouet on row five. Row six is the Sky Tempesta Mercedes of Eddie Cheever. Nicholas Scherl is alongside him ahead of Jean-Baptiste Simonard and Ethan Simeone. Then it is Igor Walilko and Benjamin Goethe next. He starts 16th ahead of Valentino Rossi and the quickest car in Pro-Am. Louis Machiel starts in the Ferrari ahead of his teammate Hugo Delacour. Adrian Delina's Porsche ahead of Ollie Wilkinson's McLaren and uh, Giorgio Roda's dynamic motorsport Porsche. Patrick Kroprinski's McLaren's had brake dramas this weekend but starts 23rd. Miguel Ramos had problems yesterday but he's on the grid 24th and he's at Tutumlu's Lamborghini rounds out the order there. The cars get themselves into the Noah's Ark two by two formation. The uh, leading car as it is will peel into the pit lane and then it is up to Elise de Pau and Jules Gounon on the front row of the grid to control the pace. You can't really go racing until the lights change. If you do, then it's an anticipatory start. Penalties could come, but the opening round of the Sprint Cup is about to get underway. Jules Gounon has got his nose in front, so eager is he to get on with the job as the lights go green and we go racing. On the inside line is Elise de Pau. Gounon drops back a little bit as up the inside line goes Matthew Drudy and there's carnage going into the first corner. Cars scatter everywhere. One Porsche is off. 
There are three cars in the gravel. There's one on the inside line. This is going to be a safety car for sure. Well, it all kicked off in the middle to the back of the field turning in and inevitably four cars into two into one is never going to go. Now, John, let's have a look at this. Well, we go racing. Forget about it. Oh, look down the inside. There's the Mercedes that caused yeah, it. That's it. it got tipped, then he was off on the inside, and the two Audis and the Porsche end up going off. So the Mercedes went way, I mean, it was off track. There it is now, mm. facing wrong way down the middle of Pedicle Bend. The Porsche was able to get regain track because its rear wheels and tires were on the tarmac. But watch for the Mercedes. There it goes now. It has actually got two wheels off the racing line inside that demarcation. And once he makes the contact, it's a bit like a game of snooker, just one car hits yeah. the other, but there's no, no pockets for them to go in. start involving car 30, 33, 54 and 86 under investigation. The other element to that, John, of course, you saw well, Ilko, as you rightly said, two wheels on the grass, but of course, the barrier starts to taper out, so the room disappears. He had to get back on the racetrack. There, look, you see it taper, so he's got to force his way back on. Yeah, I mean, it was his error that set off this whole incident. I suspect that's going to be under investigation because he did have two wheels across that white demarcation line, and that line is there for a, a reason. Yep. It's not there to allow you to use it to your advantage. Now, this is Rossi. Look, there's the Mercedes on the right. Squeeze, tries to get back on, clips the Porsche, which clips the Audi, which clips the other Audi, and Rossi... Oh, that was a real heart in mouth moment. Well, the first thing he would have done was lift his foot off the throttle as quick as possible and look for an escape route because when you find yourself in a situation like that, you need to look for an escape route. Self preservation is what Valentino Rossi was thinking at that moment. Elise tries to jink left and right, just get a bit more temperature in the Pirellis, and Jules Gounon sits there menacingly behind. You can do all the weaving you want, says Jules. I'm not going anywhere, and he'll be on his toes. Here they come then, into Clark Curve, to Pau floors the throttle, the Ferrari accelerates away, and here they come up towards the line then to get the race back Lisa. underway. Ferrari leads Mercedes, leads Audi, one, two, three, over the line. We're back racing in Fanatec GT at Brands Hatch, up towards Paddock Hill, Ben they go, and it is to Pau ahead of Gounon by 0.488 of a second as they turn right, plunge downhill and now up towards Druids. Yeah, well controlled restart by the Ferrari, and really nobody's been managing to either gain or lose positions on this restart. Downhill, though, for the first time, if you like, proper, uh, without any fear of yellow flags. So the pit window remains in exactly the same place. So these drivers have got fewer laps within their stint than they would have liked. So they've got to push, push, push. And one of them pushing is Rossi. He's there in 14th place, trying to catch on to the back of Ethan Simeone in the McLaren. And Timor Bogoslavski there goes through in 89. Mercedes down in fifth place, just ahead of the blue Audi of Aurelien Panis. But Depau, once more, beautifully controlled restart. Very good restart. Jules Gugnon has picked up the pace, but the car in third place, Matteo Drudi, that is probably of the three cars in the lead three positions, the one that I think is looking strongest on this restart. Yeah, that Audi is perhaps quicker in the hands of Matteo Drudi than Luca Giotto, who's still adapting to GT3 cars. Eddie Chiba goes through and looking stronger in 11th place. Now, as you ride on board with the Sky Tempesta racing Mercedes up towards Sterling to go left, slightly banked corner, back onto the pound. Now, drag the car out the other side, and all of that grunt of the Mercedes takes it down towards Clearways. And having to be very defensive indeed, they saw the Audi in his mirrors, and likewise, He's up again, well, is he going to lose position? The Audi has got the drive coming off side by side all the way down, start finish line, up into Panicle Bend, concedes one place, concedes two places. Because right there as well is Ethan Simeone, who goes through, goes wide, somebody else has run really wide as well because there's gravel dust settling. They're all pushing on, but at least Depau leads from Gunon in second place. Third still is Drudy, and battles rage up and down the order. This is fourth, Bogoslavski fifth. Shiva was able to retake that position from Simononi because the mistake that was made at Panicle Bend by the McLaren driver caused him to run wide, so Shiva claimed back at least one of the two positions he lost coming across to our finish line. Fastest lap, race leader, Ulysse de Pau, 1 minute 23.4. 21 sevens in qualifying, we'll get there as the cars get lighter. But right now it is the Ferrari up front as the cars dive down towards Hawthorne. So Ulysse de Pau leading Jules Gounon and riding on board here with Valentino Rossi. Now he is shown as being in 15th place, but he was 14th at the start of the lap. So what's gone on here? That's what's happening. Ollie Wilkinson's McLaren has got ahead of him. Well, that's one place last on the race track. So Valentino Rossi will now focus it. Can I, what can I do? Ollie Wilkinson takes a load on the curb on the inside, going through Sheen. Now you can see Rossi back onto the rear of the McLaren. So there's a short run out of Sterling's all the way down into Clearways. Wilkinson going defensive just to make sure there was no chance of going down the inside by the Audi. Now the first part of this Clark, or 
clear edge Clark combination, but the McLaren begin to stretch his legs as they come across start finish line. Work to do for Rossi. And it is Ulisse de Pau at the end of lap 10, who is out on his own. The Ferrari looking dominant at the moment because he's just stroking it away. Well, he has found something with this Ferrari that even his very eminent teammate, Alexander Piol, has not been able to do. He's just got natural speed. And you can see the gap as you come across the line. Another three tenths of a second gain to the favour of the lead Ferrari. A Porsche are off up again at Sheen Curve. So what has gone on up there? I mean, this is part of the racetrack that has been resurfaced. Paddock Hill Bend, then down Graham Hill Bend, and further around the racetrack, Westfield. So it seems for some reason, let's watch and see. Oh, there's the Porsche. Oh, and that, yes. Oh, well, all the guys who spend all the time putting up those track advertisers, that's going to be, it needs to be removed because cars will be running out to the very edge of that white line. Uh. So that needs to be removed. How are you going to put a marshal out there and do it without putting out a full course yellow? I'm not quite sure. John, we're riding with Valentino Rossi. He does like to run wide coming out of Graham Hill Bend. Now up into Surtees, brings the Audi's nose in, makes his apex, gets that all bit right now. You can't say he's doing anything that's not correct. The only thing is he hasn't yet evolved enough time behind the wheel to develop his natural skills to get the pace that ultimately he is seeking. The car's already making their way into the pit lane because the pit lane window is open. And the first one in is Drudy. So that's, and also Charles Wirtz and Timur Bogoslavski uh, are in early within the window. So uh, number 12 and Matthew Drudy, 32, Charles Wirtz and 89, uh, Timur Bogoslavski all in. And so is Valentino Rossi, eager to let Fred Vervich take over and get on with the job. Yes, yeah, so I mean, the, the team, it is a team game. It's not just about an individual behind the wheel. So Fred Vervich already there, opens the door and helps Valentino Rossi out of the car. Then that will be returned as the seat belts and shoulder straps in particular are assisted by Rossi. Get the lap strap done up first of all, then you've got the crutch strap, then the shoulder straps as the lead Ferrari comes through. 3.4 seconds advantage, and he is going to stay out until this pit stop window is about to close. What Jules Gugnon is doing is there, Val uh, Fred Ravish returns to the track, so stays on the lead lap, which is going to be key for this car's ultimate uh, result. Well, those very early stoppers will maybe gain the, the certainly the, the track advantage. We're all off a Porsche again. Can't get back on the racetrack because of the traffic. Couldn't cut back on because of the furniture lying on the ground. So number 56 having a, a, a second drama of the race. And once more, it's Giorgio Roda. Yeah, he seems to like that part of the off-track track up at the sheet curve. It's not something he's doing intentionally, just getting caught by... Whatever, we'll maybe find out later why he was off there so many times. Right, so the cars come over the timing line and on the pit stops, uh, Luca Giotto, number 12, has fallen back behind Dries Van Thor. So the third and fourth place Audis have switched over. Not surprised, WRT Audi, the masters of the driver change, pit stop, four wheels, tyres. So Gugnon stayed out, he stayed yeah. out. So it's a Ferrari lead Ferrari. I wonder why they would have brought this car in so early because Ulissi de Pau was doing such a great job in my view, keep about as long as possible. But the team have to make these calls. They've re rehearsed, discussed, decided what they're going to do. Just going back to my Audis for a moment, the Dries Van Thor entry, number 32, moving ahead of number 12, now Luca Giotto. 41.4 seconds in the pits for number 32 from WRT. Hold that thought, 41.4. The number 12 Audi, 44.9. So again, WRT on the pit stops, boom, gain a place. You can't make up that time in the racetrack. That's why the pit stop, the driver change, is such a fundamental and, and, and important part, particularly in a one-hour sprint race. There's 89 Mercedes. This is now Raffaele Marchiello, and he's getting himself onto the back of Luca Giotto, who's nowhere near as experienced a GT racer. And Marchiello should, I would have thought, make short work of him here. Look at the pressure that's being applied. Dive down the inside, but it's all cut off by Giotto. He's got lots and lots of great single-seater experience. So now the next opportunity is up the inside into Surtees again. Giotto covers that. So now frustration already on the opening lap for Raffaele Marcello to find a way around the number 12 Audi, but right again under the rear wing. Defence on the right-hand side now. Well, the Mercedes has got the benefit of being a little bit later in the brakes into Hawthorne's. He's got oh. the pass, good pass. Giotto had to concede. He was too tight coming into Hawthorne's and had to get out of the throttle. And there he can see the lead Ferrari now in the hands of Pierre-Alexandre Jean. 
Oh, wide, 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 Reese Van Thor. Why are you so wide at Paddock? He saved it, a little mistake. And there, smashing through the polystyrene was 87, the Casper Stevenson Mercedes. So that's why it's now in fragments. I think it was really trying to get round the porter. Yeah. Yeah. It's just limping its way back towards the pit lane. Right, in comes, as Adam Carroll dubbed him at Alton Park, chicken nugget. Uh, so Jules Gounon comes in. And uh, down the pit road comes 88. Now, he did have, of course, the Sky Tempesta Mercedes ahead on that lap, so he might have just dropped a little bit of time. But the key to all of this is the pit stop time. The pit stop time from the Ferrari was 46.6 seconds. They've got to beat that to try to get the lead. That's going to be a big ask. I mean, we know that, that the uh, Coders ASP team are pretty sharp in the pit lane. There is the Ferrari that effectively is our leader coming through. Sheen curve, so the wheels tires being changed. Jules Gugnot standing back, oh. watching. Get off the pit lane, Jules. But that wheel didn't go on. No, they it lost didn't. time there, and you can see the frustration from Jules Gugnot. The car's away now, but that would have cost them time. So we'll see when it breaks the beam at pit out. The Ferrari goes through, back into the lead. But the Mercedes is going to drop down the order. Let's see, because across the line, now there's Van Thor, and it's cost the Mercedes crew a place. The car rejoins, but that was 46 and a half seconds. But well, watch Marcello, he has just set the fastest race lap. Looking to get alongside up the you know, Jim Pla is on the defence on the inside. Marcello tries to go the long way around. He's got to be careful. He's now half on the racetrack, half off it, but he has found space down the inside into Graham Hill Bend. He can pick up his momentum, he momentarily lost it. And he was, well, how do I find a way past Jim Plow in my sister car? He made it, he forced it. And that's part of what Raffaele Marcello is all about. So second, all the way through the first stint, and fourth with half a lap of the next stint done. And Jules Gounon is going to be very frustrated, you can tell that. You don't need me to tell you it, because some of the time was lost with that left rear wheel that just wouldn't seat. They had to try again and again and again. And that's cost them a big chunk of time. Let's have a look at this. Go to the left rear. Wheel goes on, won't, won't, Oops. won't, try again, try again, try again, look at that. Watching Christopher Hassa. oh, and the Mercedes Stevenson runs wide. A, a gift, an absolute gift for Christopher Hassa. Indeed so, and he takes full advantage of that. And there is the race leader. Now, there is traffic ahead, and Dries Van Thor is only a second and a half behind him. That traffic is uh, not getting out of the way, and Pierre-Alexander Jean can't find a way through, and he looks at the data, looks at the gap, and says, where's all the time gone? It was 2.8, now it's a second and a half. So this little fight that you're looking at as they come through between the Audis is now for sixth. Luca Giotto uh, being reeled in by his much more experienced teammate Christopher Hauser. Ignore the car behind because Gerhard Sverhauser in that Lamborghini is a lap down. So it's the two car collection Audis going toe to toe, sixth and seventh. You've got to put your money on Hauser, really, given his experience. You have in terms of experience, but you know, a driver like Luca Giotto, who's come out of very competitive very combative single-seater racing will be glued one eye on the mirror, one eye on the racetrack. And we know that he's prepared to use the racetrack to defend. And that will frustrate Christopher Hauser, who has got maybe natural speed, but can't find ultimately the pace to get away around the, uh, the number 12 ID, Luca Giotto. The race leader is on his last warning for track limits at Graham Hill Bend. So Pierre-Alexandre Jean has had enough warnings, penalties come from here on in. Let's so have a look. This is what he has been doing, right up over there. But look yeah, at but Van look Thor, at he's even wider. Well, and Marcello, all three lead cars are guilty, my lad, of the yep. same penalty. So are they getting notifications likewise? They were down the order there. Andrea Bertolini goes through, number 52. He's still on the tail of Christian Kleen. Still can't find a way past the Dean McDonald is right with him. This is for second, third and fourth within Pro-Am. It's been like this for lap after lap, but you get the feeling now something might give. As Druids turns, Pierre Alexander Jean, who made a real name for himself in Alpines in GT4 racing, but has adapted to this Ferrari just like Release the Power has incredibly well this weekend. Well, Charles Witts would dearly like for something to give his car an advantage. Elise de Pau can barely watch all of this because he did a mega job in his stint. Now, this would be the ideal opportunity. It's and yes, Malilko does get out of the way. Sorry, Umbrescu does get out of the way. Blue lights on. What a dramatic start to our Sprint Cup season in Fanatec GT. The chequered flag is at the ready, and it is going to be a win for AF Corsa, for Elise de Pau, and for Pierre Alexander Jean, who brings home the Ferrari to win race one of the Sprint Cup at Brands Hatch. Dries Van Thor is second, Raffaele Marcello is third, and a brilliant job done by the Ferrari team. This for fourth is Jim Pla, delayed in the pits, but fourth is the reward. And Ulisse de Pau can finally breathe. Great result for AF Corsa. Great result for the two drivers, Ulisse de Pau and Pierre-Alexandre Jean. 
a faultless race, great pit stop, only the concerns of those closing laps. And Vavish has got himself looked right onto the back of Rob Bell. I don't think he's quite going to be able to get close enough to make a move at the very end, but not for the want of trying as they come across the line. So Rob Bell 12th and Fred Vavish with Valentino Rossi 13th. Uh, Cedric Sprazioli is about to come through to win in Pro-Am, but second, third, fourth, they're still in the same order. They're stuck behind 93 for uh, the uh, 93 Mercedes, I should say. It's Sky Tempesta racing. Chris Froggart fending them all off. And so Christian Clean keeps Bertolini and also Dean McDonald at bay down through Clark Curve. They will come in a moment, the flag awaits. And so, although Sprazioli has been through to win in Pro-Am, for second it's going to be Clean and Krapinski, and they might just get a place overall because the McLaren is absolutely level with the Mercedes and does go through on the line. And the margin between Clean and Froggart was 14 thousandths of a second. Wow. And um, it's been a rare outright win in sprint for Ferrari, but Ulysse de Pau absolutely overjoyed. And Pierre Alexander Jean was able to show his mettle, didn't crack under the pressure. No, he did a very, very good job indeed. I know he was disappointed he expressed that disappointment after his qualifying <laughs> session Saturday afternoon. But look at that emotion. Go on, go on, guys. Brilliant. Let it go. Brilliant. So after a couple of seasons in the privateer CMR Bentley, they've made the step to really the top Ferrari team, AF Corsa, and uh, a brilliant job. Charles Weir, it's really nice to see. He's the first one from anywhere other than their own team to come across and say well done. He knows what it feels like to have that first GT win, and although he's only second, and there's Vincent Voss, the team principal with Dries Van Thorpe, they gave it the best shot. Right, let's hear then from Pierre-Alexander Jean and Ulysse de Pau, winners of our first Sprint Cup race of the year. PA, still just getting your helmet off and celebrations. Absolutely wonderful to see the both of you so excited. Ulysse, you drove the incredible stint there and it was hard for you to watch that second stint. Yeah, it's uh, I'm over the moon. It's uh, simply amazing. Uh, the car was perfect. Uh, it's the perfect scenario for us to start the championship like that. Uh, hats off to uh, IF Corsair for a stunning car and uh, PA for finishing the job and uh, kept the other under pressure, so uh, I'm out of the world. I know you can get your winner's hat on. <laughs> well yeah, done it's to you. Do you know what, as Look you were up. coming into here in Park Ferme, I could hear you screaming within the car. <laughs> and you know what, last year in Manico, I told you every time that it, I eat egg in the morning, it works. I eat egg this morning with my, uh, with my teammate and apparently it works correctly, so yeah, very happy. What a race, what a race. Uh, congrats to this guy who did uh, a very, very good job starting pole, get, get away and give me a perfect car. So after I just had to put some laps, be careful about track limit. And uh, yeah, when this race on the first race of the season is uh, is quite good. We still have a long season ahead, but uh, it's good to start like this. So let's look at the provisional results of the opening Sprint Cup race of the Fanatec GT season. A win for Ulysse de Pau and Pierre-Alexander Jean, ahead of Charles Wynn, Cedric Van Thor, Timo Bogostowski and Raffaele Marcello third, ahead of Jules Gounon and Jim Clark with Aurelien Panis uh, fifth, and Patrick Niederhauser uh, with a top six rounded out by Mattia Drudi and Luca Giotto. Uh, the class winners, well, as we've been saying, uh, silver to the outright winners of UDP and PAJ. The winning pros, Charles Witt, Dries Van Thor, and you go down to uh, 14th place and find Hugo Delacour and Cedric Sprazioli as the winners of Pro Am. And of course, quite a few hard luck stories, both dynamic Porsches we lost with different incidents, and two of the WRT Audi fleet at turn one. Jean Baptiste Simonard and Benji Goethe off in the incident that gave Mercedes 86 of Igor Walilko that 10 second stop go penalty. But the outright win goes to the taller Ulysse de Pau, of course, a regular out of Jonathan Palmer's uh, British Formula 3 Championship a few seasons back, and to Pierre Alexander Jean, who receives his winner's trophy now as well. AF Corsa's rep with them on the podium. And uh, the Ferrari team very, very pleased indeed with what has been a great result. The AF Corsa squad wins at Brands Hatch. The grid for race two is formed here at Brands Hatch and it's a little bit more overcast, it's a little bit cooler than it was earlier and we've also had quite a bit of rain over the last hour. The track has been declared wet, it isn't raining now but we have had a bit uh, and it's made the circuit just a little bit greasy. David Addison and John Watson are trackside and John I don't think that rain is going to do very much for the track surface now but we will see. Well it's been declared a wet track uh, so I mean, to me, from what I can see in the commentary position, 
It looks perfectly suitable for slick tyres, but I'm not in the com. I'm, I'm in the commentary booth, not behind the wheel. Well, the fans, who many of whom are here to see Valentino Rossi, have stayed through that inclement weather ready for race two. The national anthem has just been played, and the build-up to this second 60-minute sprint race is uh, all the while getting closer to releasing the cars. The teams are on the grid with the tyre trolleys, so they can make a last uh, decision whether they want to go slicks or wets. And uh, I think it is going to be, as John said, slicks pretty much for everybody, unless we get another sprinkling of rain. Well, right now, uh, I'm looking skywards. No pun intended. <laughs> uh, it looks like it's blowing through or has blown through. Yeah. Uh, it never really rained heavily. It just was just never stopped. Mm. But the track eventually did get damp enough to make it tricky for the support races that we were broadcasting on. Well, let's, before we go racing, go to the grid. Gemma Scott is down there, and so also is Raffaele Marciello. He's going to start on pole position for this second race. Let's hear from Raffaele with Gemma. Raffaele, yesterday's qualifying was somewhat dramatic. We can see the marks on the car, and there was speculation of whether or not you did touch the tyre. Well, clearly you did, uh, but finally put in that all-important lap time. Yeah, it's important to start on pole here, uh, but because our car is fast, so it, it was a good reward to the mechanics and engineer for the hard work they did. Talk to me about the race earlier on as well, because you seem to be struggling a little bit with pace, but then towards the end, pushing hard onto Dries Van Tour. Yeah, I mean, uh, I had to overtake two cars, then I was yeah, pretty stuck behind Dries all my stint. I mean, our car, like, car is quick, so we just try to keep in front as in T1 in first lap and then I think we can have a good pace. It was declared a wet race a little bit earlier on but it's very much dried out now. Yeah I mean as every time you say same for everyone so if it's dry or wet the guy who adapt well will win so I mean it's the same for everyone. Have a great race thank you very much Raffaele. Let's have a look at that uh, incident from qualifying. Gemma referred to uh, Raffaele in a dramatic qualifying session. You can see the scuff marks on it. This is what he did. He ran wide out of paddock. Look how close he got to the barrier and he just skimmed that sheeting around the tyre wall as he bounced back onto the circuit. John, it could have been a lot worse. It certainly could have been very much worse because of the front of the car had hit the barrier then. That chassis would not be running here this afternoon or let alone the morning. So he got away with it and Raffaele Marcello sometimes makes a habit of getting away with it but that was a little bit too close for comfort for the team, least of all for Raffaele Marcello. So hopefully that's got it out of his system. Uh, the Mercedes finished uh, third in the earlier race that was won by Ulysse de Pau and Pierre-Alexandre Jean. Pierre-Alexandre Jean will start, and that means that Ulysse de Pau has got a couple of moments to speak to Gemma pre-race. Ulysse, it's been a fantastic start to the weekend for you guys so far. I know Pierre struggled a little bit in his qualifying yesterday, but still a fantastic place to be on the grid. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we are obviously very happy of the race one. Uh, it's the perfect way to start the season, as I already said. But uh, now uh, it's uh, not the moment to enjoy. We will enjoy tonight. We have a second race, uh, lo lots of points to take for the championship. So uh, all our focus are on the race too. Um, we are starting sixth, Paul in silver. So uh, we will target the silver cup wins and some good points for the overall championship. You've driven here at Brands Hatch a lot, and I know you love the circuit. Tell us what it's like for you once you've got everything together as a package. The car great, and you feeling great. It is the best combo ever that you can find. Uh, I, I always say that uh, when you enjoy uh, driving your car, you are fast, and that's the best sensation you can get. Um, on the other hand, when you don't feel uh, good with your car around a track like Brands Hatch, I can tell you that it's not funny. But luckily, it's not the case this weekend, so I'm enjoying it. And of course, jumping in for the second stint, PA's got the hard work to do. Yeah, uh, we turn around this time, so uh, he will start, get a clean start, and then uh, we will see how it goes. Uh, there is always many things happening in this sprint race, so I'm looking forward. Thank you, have a great race. And another Silver Cup pole. You get a point for pole position as well within the classes. Spoke a lot of common sense there, because for this race, they're starting back on the third rule of the grid, sixth position. There's Alexander Jean, uh, who will be starting the race. So they're focusing on their class, their Silver Cup class. Anything else is going to be a bonus. So, I mean, for a young man, a lot of common sense. Let's have a look at this circuit, because it is, we keep saying, an old school circuit. But, John, it's got some fantastic challenges to it. As nine principal corners, two and a half miles in length, 3.9 kilometers. Each corner more or less blends into the other, and it's one of the problems of brands is because of the layout, fantastic to drive, mm. 
but it is a very difficult racetrack to get a good clean run, but principally to get an overtaking opportunity. And up into Druids, that tight Herpin Bend at the second corner on the circuit is one of the most popular places, but equally one of the most easy defended. Well, it's a very big crowd that we have this weekend. Many of them, of course, here to cheer on Valentino Rossi uh, in the WRT Audi. Another WRT Audi driver, reigning champion, Charles Weirds. Charles, I know there have been some difficulties at the beginning of the weekend, looking at the setup and getting the right pace, but certainly that last race, you seem to be really picking up and fighting hard. Yeah, exactly. Uh, team did great. Uh, we really went forward with the car. We know that we still have that, have the, that ultimate pace to really uh, be in the, in the mix and really fight in the front, but still, uh, Dries managed to, to, to put a super lap yesterday in qualifying, so starting P3 and brand such is always a good thing, as it's quite difficult to overtake, so we'll just try to get a clean race, a good start, and hopefully a good pit stop, and then let's see where it brings us. Thank you very much. Have a good one. Charles shares with Dries van Thor by our Silver Cup, uh, sorry, not Silver, the uh, Sprint Cup, I should say, champions last year and the year before. So they're fighting for three in a row as you look at the winning car from earlier on in the day. Sprint Cup wins to Ferraris have not been that numerous, but Pierre-Alexandre Jean and Ulysse de Pau did an exceptional job earlier on in the day. Yeah, just going back to uh, Charles Verts, their car, 32 Audi, actually not badly placed in the grid. It's on the second row of the grid, but directly behind Raffaele Marcello. So I'm quite certain that Dries van Thor, when the race goes green, is going to do everything he can to stick the Audi onto the rear bumper of the Mercedes and try and block out Patrick Niederhauser in the Santa Lock Racing Audi, who's starting on the outside of the front row of the grid. You saw a moment ago Jim Plough's Mercedes. That is the hair, Christopher Hauser, in the uh, car collection by Trezor. Audi, he shares with Simon Gachet. There in the pit lane is number 30 Audi. Now there's a saga attached to this car because so badly damaged was Ben Goethe's car in the earlier race, it got as far as Paddock and was involved in an accident, that effectively they've had to build up a replacement car. And because it is a replacement, not the original, it has to start from the pits and also serve an extra 10 seconds in the pit lane. Thomas Neubauer uh, will start. The extra 10 seconds come during the pit stop window. So uh, that car is very much on the back foot. They don't even get a hardship lap. They're just going to start from the pits and go for it. Uh, third on the grid, Dries Van Thor starts for TWRT, the double sprint cup champions then. Dries and Charles Witz, we've heard from already. And Patrick Niederhauser, who John was talking about a moment ago, will start on the outside of the front row of the grid after a really impressive qualifying run yesterday. There you can see number 46, Audi, which will start 10th. Frederick Verwisch will start, lining up directly behind him. Christian Kleen in the Pro-Am Cup uh, pole sitting JP Motorsport McLaren so another point in class for that and if you look at number 25 that is second on the grid Patrick Niederhauser with Aurelien Panis this again has got to be a really good prospect for a podium yes and Niederhauser he will know the benefits of starting in the front row of the grid but by being on the left hand side as they come up into Padical Bend Dries van Thor directly behind pole sitter Raffaele Marcello he needs to a try put his Audi as close as possible to this car on the entry into Paddockville Bend and principally preclude Dries van Thor from trying to undercut the Niederhauser, the Santa Lock Racing Audi into Paddockville Bend. And then, of course, the, the outcome of running up into Druids is another opportunity. So two opportunities in the opening two corners for pretty much the, for certainly the first three rows of this grid. So then, the one-minute board is shown, the grid is cleared. Those last engineers stay until they have to fire up the engine. All they can then do is say to their driver, good luck, and they make their way back through the gaps in the pit wall into the pit lane, and they'll be pressed into service between 25 and 35 minutes when the pit stop window uh, opens. If they're in action before that, then the chances are the car has got a problem, and that is what they do not need. The grid is complete, with the exception of number 30 Audi. There you can see it, the green and white car, the replacement car, starting from the pit lane. Lane, but it will join in to give us 27 cars, uh, sorry, to give us, I should say, 25 uh, cars. The 26th car had to be withdrawn because driver Alex Malikin feeling rather unwell this weekend. Ben Barker was driving yesterday, but without a co-driver, I'm afraid there wasn't the option to go racing. So the Barwell Motorsport Lamborghini has had to be withdrawn, which is a real shame. So then, the green flag is shown, and that means that the cars accelerate away from the grid. Not for the start of the race, but an opportunity to get some warmth into the Pirelli tyres before we go racing. There's been no suggestion of a second formation lap, a second green flag lap. Uh, oh, no, I'll tell you a lie. There is the board. Now, it's not come up on the screen, but I just caught a glimpse of the board saying extra formation lap. So it's not been 
announced on the timing screen, but the board was there, so I'm anticipating we will get two, one of which may count within the time. Yeah, I've got to say, the second formation lap may well be a part of the race, albeit behind the safety car. And, and the track temperature right now down to 18 Celsius was up to 22.3 earlier in the round midday when the first round of these two sprint races got underway. So Rafael Di Marcello and Patrick Niederhauser line up on the front row ahead of Dries van Thor and Christopher Hauser, and then Jim Plough and Pierre Alexander Jean go first on row three. It's Dennis Marshall starting seventh alongside Christopher Meese. Luca Giotto starts ninth, and Fred Verbiche is alongside him with Casper Stevenson sharing the next row with Christian Klein. Then from Pro Am, Andrea Bertolini goes toe to toe with Cedric Brazzioli, the two teammates at AF Corsa. The Porsche of Christian Engelhardt alongside Rob Bell's McLaren. The Audis are next, Alex Arca and uh, Nicholas Barth ahead of Klaus Backler's Porsche and the Mercedes of Chris Frog at the Sky Tempesta Racing entry. Manuel Maldonado's Garage 59 McLaren is next with Gerhard Schwerhauser's Lamborghini alongside. And the last row of the grid is Dean McDonald's McLaren. And alongside him is Petru Umbarescu, who is starting from the pits, Thomas Neubauer. Silver Cup outright winner here in 2019. So two formation laps, the second one will count within the hour. So the clock will start at the end of this lap, as we were saying, and the therefore first lap will be a controlled lap, but it'll be a normal start process at the end of the second formation lap. So rather than uh, a safety car start as such, two formation laps, but the second one will count within the hour. Fred Verdich aboard number 46 Audi, down towards clearways, and you can see just what it's like in the cab with all of the netting, all of the safety requirements, that huge roll cage, and there, about to be released, is number 30, Thomas Neubauer. So he'll have to wait until the entire field goes across the start-finish line before he can be released. Chris Frogger in the Mercedes. Great noise the Mercedes AMG GT3 makes. There it is, across the line. It was a, a tough weekend yesterday with... Uh, clutch problems, transmission problems, but eventually the team got on top of it and Eddie Chiva really did a good job in his stint uh, earlier on in the day. Into the race now goes number 30 Audi that joins from the pit. So this is our second formation lap, but we are already with the clock ticking, as you see. Yes, so uh, our board with the third row of the grid, Jim Plower. So field streams now onto the Grand Prix loop here at Blanche Hatch through the exit of Surtees Corner. Part of the surface here is this has been resurfaced as well, and where you, you've got resurfacing, not the entire circuit. In dry conditions, it's not so difficult, but you've got these mixed conditions, albeit now it's virtually dry anyway. It's a little bit trickier, so drivers are going to have to be aware, but I think right now we're set for a dry one hour uh, qualify, it's not qualifying race, sprint race to the checkered flag. So who's your money on, then, on the evidence of the first? Oh, well, I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> I've, I've been wrong every time I've opened my mouth. <laughs> well, but there. Right, right, in theory, you've been the Mercedes, the 89 Mercedes yeah. of Marcello and uh, Bogoslavski ought to be in the party, but don't discount the 32 RD. I mean, the fascination in 89's case is, is whether Bogoslavski can match the pace of others in his stint. He's not slow, but he's not the outright fastest. If he's got clear track ahead of him, he's not going to be into a, 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 you know, a nose-to-tail fight. He can do a very good job, but he hasn't ultimately got the, the pace in traffic and you know, getting his elbows out that Marciello does. So now you see the cars start to get themselves into the two-by-two -two formation for the rolling start. They don't stop on the grid, they go straight into the race. The pace car peels into the pit lane, then we're going to be in business. So left and right, they go to their respective sides of the grid and make their way down towards clearway. So it's going to be, in terms of racing laps, slightly shorter. It's still a one-hour race, but we've lost one lap effectively with the extra formation lap after the change in weather conditions. Down towards clearways they come. Raffaele Marciello versus Patrick Niederhauser on the front row. It is Dries Van Thor alongside Christopher Hauser on the second row of the grid. And this is the view from Jim Pla, who starts fifth. The pace car peels in. It is up now towards the timing line. Raffaele Marciello in the Mercedes on pole position. Patrick Niederhauser in the blue Audi lines up alongside. The lights will go green to get the race underway any second now. And a really good getaway by Marciello, who's about three lengths clear of everybody else on the run up towards Paddock. He called them napping. That was a demon start. And Niederhauser did a good job to get that Audi. And look at the Ferrari almost four wheels off the track. 
up towards Drew is there. Much yellow getting away. There on the outside line is the Ferrari. Pierre Alexander Jean goes wide, wide, wide into Drew is. Jim Pla nips up the inside and gets ahead of him. And now look at the Ferrari. The white Ferrari on the inside goes up to try to gain a place. And Van Thor rounds Hauser out wide as they come through Graham Hill Bank for the first time. And drama there. Around has gone the number 18 Lamborghini. That is Gerhard Terraza. And he had a bit of help in that. Yes, I know. the nose of the ID up against the door of the Lamborghini. But here we are following. So this is on board Jimmy Plow looking at the back of the 3200 to get through there. So, so Nina Hauser consolidating that second place. Whoops, sideways Porsches very nearly getting together there. The Porsche's got a puncture, I think the right yeah. rear has been cut down, probably contact somewhere. That's why the, everybody's stacked up coming through Hawthorns. Right, look back there, you can see there the Jim Pla Mercedes, which is running in what, fourth place, good getaway. But Rafael Marcello has checked out, look at this, he's on his own, he's nearly in the next round of the championship. Nina Hauser is second, third is Van Thor, fourth is Pla, and then in fifth place is Hauser as they come up towards the line. The dramas for a number of teams on that opening lap, but Marcello's gap is obscene. Well, he comes across the line way clear. I mean, I don't know whether he jumped the start or whether he just anticipated it better than anybody else, but he left the rest of the field, literally, as you say, standing, and has now got a very comfortable in the opening lap, two second advantage. Yeah, two seconds after one lap, Oof, that's going. As Fred Verbeek in 10th place in number 46, the Valentino Rossi Audi, if you like, turns out of Druids, but he's on the attack now, closing onto the back of German driver Dennis Marshall in another of the Audi R8s, run out of a different stable. The Attempto Racing team there, side by side, look, Ferrari versus Porsche, two great GT brands, and Cedric Sprazioli in the Ferrari gets up the inside of Klaus Backler and goes through. These Porsches are really struggling this weekend. I, I don't know what the reasons are. Normally, Porsche's performance is much more con consistent. But here, all weekend, both the dynamic motorsport Porsches have been, well, I would say, very much off colour. And there is Christian Klee in the McLaren. Now, of course, ex Grand Prix racer. He's in eighth place, absolutely storming along. It's a Pro-Am car. When the Pro is in it, it'll be right up at the top. When the Am, it'll drop down. There's a yellow flag that's been waving there. Has somebody gone off the racetrack? Well, it was yellow just oh. in the middle of Sheen, but it's green now in the exit, so somebody is well and truly off. It look, I think it's the other Porsche that's parked right up against the barrier out of harm's way because Christian Engelhart, I don't think, came through at the end of the first lap. So I think Engelhart's parked right up against the tyres was the car we saw with that puncture. Right, leaders go through. So Marcello leads Niederhauser, two seconds, with Van Thor in third. In fourth is Pla, fifth is Hauser, sixth is the Ferrari that won race one. Pierre-Alexander Jean ahead of Mies, Clean, Marshall and Vaviche. Niederhauser has managed to check the pace of Marcello because it was just two seconds when they came across the line. It's now a fraction above it, but doing a good job keeping in contact with the lead Mercedes. Right, now, Raffaele Marciello, as you say, two seconds to the good. He has done the fastest lap, but Niederhauser is certainly not letting him get away. And if anything, now, Jim Pla taking this third-place battle to Dries Van Thorpe. There they are. Look, Audi versus Mercedes. Fifth is Hauser's Audi. Sixth there is Pierre-Alexander Jean. But right now, Dries Van Thorpe is having to think about repelling Jim Pla's advance rather than getting onto the back of Patrick Niederhauser. Yes, and Jim Pla, um, I mean, not... Well, that's him. The, the, Gugnon is the screwdriver, is marginally the quicker screwdriver, but Van Thor has got to be aware that, what, half a second and a little bit, the number 88 Mercedes is right there to pounce on the 32 Audi. Just in the background, you saw Christian Engelhardt sprinting away from his parked Porsche. It was that punctured tyre that caused him to stop. In fairness to Christian, he has pulled well out of harm's way, so he's done a good job there. Uh, and it uh, isn't at all in an awkward place, so the yellow just covers it for now as Jim Pla hustles out of Clark Curve. Now, up front, Marcello leads Patrick Niederhauser. Niederhauser goes across the line. The gap has gone up, though, two and a half seconds, so the Mercedes using all of that grunt. There goes Niederhauser. That's Van Thor. Third, fourth is Pla, fifth is Hauser, sixth is Jean into Druids. Bear in mind, of course, is that mandatory pit stop, and you know how good WRT pit stops are. That's going to be maybe the key for the 32 Audi, but it's got to find a way around the Santa Log. 25 of Patrick Niederhauser, who's got a 1.2 second advantage over the 32 ID of Dries Van Thor. And that's, you know, identical cars. Niederhauser, Sandalock, doing a strong job here in this early phase. Now, Niederhauser, quicker than anybody in the first sector. He's pulled back two tenths against Marcello. There is Verdich, still trapped in tenth place, not really being able to advance at the moment. He's keeping looking up, though, at bay. Christian Klein leads in Pro-Am, incidentally, and the leading silver is Pierre-Alexandre Jean once more in that Ferrari. 
Well, that there is the Ferrari, the winner of the opening qualifying or opening sprint race here on Sunday. And here, Alexander Jean maybe got a little bit muscled out and threw it on that opening lap. It certainly was wide coming through Paddock and then got elbowed out through Drew's so last position, albeit that, that car started on the third row of the grid in sixth place and is currently in sixth place. Now, there's a replay of the start. Uh, again, Mark Yellow was just it was so good. Two or three lengths clear as he got to the line. Everybody else having to scrap over second place. But Mark Yellow's first lap on cold tyres, impressive. Yeah, but well, the light literally went out and he was hard on it. Mm. And the field behind seemed to be just hesitant at getting as quickly or reacting as quickly as we saw from Marcello. Now, that advantage that he got on this opening, look, you can see already he's got maybe half a second of an advantage over Niederhauser as the rest of the field thunders all the way down through Paddock of Ben. Here's the few back from Chris Van Thor's Audi. The Ferrari's trying to get in, it's trying to get in, but there's no for it to go. The Ferrari's holding it out, and that was part of what lost the Ferrari some of the ground. Look how wide it gets at the exit of Paddock of Ben. Pierre Alexander Jean going deep into the corner. Jim Clark right on the tail of the Audi here. Yeah, and that's really the, the, the ball was lost into Drews by being a little bit too late on the brakes. This is Jim Clark's view. Ferrari on the left. Audi's absolutely side by side ahead. Brave stuff by Banthor around the outside. Uh, this is Chris Froggett's view of the start. McLaren comes storming past, doesn't it? Yes, it did. It wasn't the best start for Chris Froggen. Although he's running in ninth, eight, yes, 19th position right now, but that was a pass that he didn't really want to give up. And this is Fred Verbici's getaway, turning through Paddock. Very wide, runs the kerb. And this was the drama, Gerhard Ferraza given a tap by Nicholas Bart, and around he went, and right. others have to scatter. Right, Nicholas Bart had virtually four wheels off the racetrack, so... And there's the Porsche with the puncture getting sideways. Whether it went at that moment, it's hard to gauge, but either way, it was certainly a puncture and it pulled off two corners later. It, it may have happened a little bit earlier in the lap, but the consequence was he put a big load into the left rear of the car into Hawthorne, and it didn't like it, and it snapped very aggressively. Everybody else having to take very uh, rapid avoiding action. Out of Surtees then, on lap seven of one hour of racing here at Brands Hatch, and the lead gap is now 3.4 seconds. Rafael Di Marcello, absolutely storming away, 122.9, but he's got to do this in order for Timur Bogoslavski to preserve that in the second stint. But what might be concerning WRT ID more is that Dries van Thor is now one and a half seconds behind Patrick Niederhauser in the identical car, albeit in a different team. Out of Sheen curve into Sterling's, there goes Christian Clean, eighth overall. Now that JP Motorsport McLaren started the weekend with pretty serious brake dramas, but now they've really got on top of it, and Christian Clean running in eighth place overall, going well, and that actually is the best place of all the McLarens right now, ahead of the Jota car and the Garage 59 entries. 3.8 seconds, the gap first to second, 1.6 is the gap se th second to third. So, one point, again, Dries van Thor seems to have nothing available to him to, to challenge the second place, Patrick Niederhauser. through Graham Hill Bend. Be careful not to go too wide, because if you do, the track limit warnings will come. Break for Surtees, turn left and then climb the hill. So Christopher Hauser looking to make a move on Jim Plough, being followed up by Pierre Alexander Jean, who had a difficult opening lap, now getting settled in behind the wheel of the Ferrari as we go on board with Fred Ravish in the 46 RD. This is the car that will be taken over, well, in the next 15 or more minutes by Valentino Rossi. So, running behind Dennis Marshall in the 66 attempt to racing Audi. There goes Fred Verbeesh in 10th, and he's now right on the back of Dennis Marshall. So we could be on for a place change here as they go past the stricken Christian Engelhardt Porsche, which we understand was suspension rather than a tyre. Uh, other gaps are closing, John, as well. Yes, 6th to 5th. Now, that's really because I think Jim Plough may be holding up a little bit of the, the pace of Christopher Hauser, and that's drawing the Ferrari up to the tail of the number 11 Audi. So to the timing line they will come. Remember the pit window between 25 and 35 minutes, so mandatory driver changes and the tyres will be changed as well. Over the line goes Vervish, he's almost, almost, almost close enough to make a go, but not at Paddock that time around. There's three-way car battle going on with uh, fourth, fifth and sixth place is going to be interesting. The Ferrari looks 
now to be at the pace that we saw in the earlier sprint race. Looking back from Jim Plough, there's Christian Clean in the McLaren. Further down the field, Fred Ravish still chasing Dennis Marshall. See how wide they run out of Graham Hill Bend. And there is the Chris Froggart Sky Tempest and Mercedes with behind a car that got a grid drop for behavioural warning points. The Mercedes being started by Petru and Mareshku, but it was the behaviour warning points for his co-driver Igor Walilko that condemned it to a grid drop after a number of incidents this weekend. The Sky Tempesta team on the back foot, they lost really much of the running before qualifying, but they bounced back pretty strongly. Yes, they have, and of course, unfortunately, some of that on the, on the back foot wasn't qualifying, so they really may be starting a three or two or three rows certainly further back than they would have anticipated. And you see there the green and white Audi, the third of these four cars. That, remember, was the uh, car that started from the pits, joined in then at the back of the grid. It is Thomas Neubauer, who won outright as a Silver Cup driver here in 2019 in a Mercedes. He is there, he's on the tail of the traffic as they come now down towards clearways, so chipping his way forward. But even in a competitive car from the Pro Cup, it is not easy to get through. No, I mean, he'll get through some of the, what might call the tail enders, but once he clears those cars, then everybody else is going to be a lot more of a challenge. So the next target is the Romanian driver, Petro Umbereshku, but it's not easy to find a way by. On board with Chris Froggett. He's got them stacked up behind him, but he's resisting all of that pressure very nicely. Is that Mercedes noisier than any other Mercedes, or is it just where the microphone on the cockpit is based? It does sound noisy, you're right. Might be where the microphone is. But he was making a funny noise yesterday, that's for sure. It is loud. Well, the Mercedes boom along Cooper Straits. And under braking there, Thomas Neubauer, ex-Mercedes racer himself, closes a touch onto the back of Umberescu. This is Froggett again at work. Grabs a gear. And the McLaren just going through the shot ahead is Manuel Maldonado. There is Thomas Neubauer then from the back of the grid. Doing his best to get forward, but he just can't get through the traffic as this is second and third. Patrick Niederhauser ahead of Dries Van Thor. And they've certainly dropped Jim Pla now, but look at the gap of Marciello. He's got the straight to himself. Yeah, but the gap between second and third looks to me to be marginally reducing. Let's see what it is coming across the line. Yeah, well, it's seven tenths of a second. That was from one and a half seconds a couple of laps ago. So either Niederhauser has made an error or Van Thor has found pace that he didn't have in the opening laps. I still think, though, that given the speed of a WRT pit stop, if they can get uh, ahead on the pit stops of the Santa Lock Audi, then certainly Vietz has a chance of hunting down Timor Bogoslavsky, because I would say that possibly Charles is the quicker of him or Timor. Yes, and then of course Aurelian Panis is going to get into the 25 Santa Lock racing Audi, and one would assume he and Charles Vietz sort of six of one, six of the other. But key to all of that is going to be whether the WRT Audi can jump Santa Lock in the pits. We know how good the WRT pit stops are, but that's not for a few minutes yet as we ride on board again with Jim Pla looking back at Christopher Hauser and then Pierre Alexander Jean doing exactly what Ulysse de Pau predicted, going for Silver Cup points. Doesn't matter what's happening overall, it is the Silver Cup points that they are after in this race. Now there's Hauser's Audi up through Sheen Curve. Dare one say they're being a little bit more restrained at Sheen. We've not had quite the same zealotry that we did in the first race. No, uh, maybe everybody's a bit conscious that while the rain that we had was not heavy, it does linger in and the apex of the corner running the curb, so but that should pretty much be clear. So these three cars, fourth, fifth, and sixth, have got their own little battle as we go back to Reese Van Thor, closing just another tenth of a second. He shaved off the advantage of Niederhauser on that last lap. So there, out of Druids, go the two Audis. Patrick Niederhauser was half a second ahead on the start of this lap of Dries Van Thor. In the flat cap is Vincent Vost, who runs WRT, and next to him was Eve Witt, Charles' father, who's the big investor in the team. And there are nervous faces at Santa Lock as Aurelian Panis looks on at Patrick Niederhauser's efforts, and Patrick is still there in second place. But, 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 it's not really a big enough gap at all to think positively about staying in second place because WRT's car is hunting down the Santa Lock entry all the time. Yeah, it's taken about a second out of the 25 Audi over the last two, three laps. Uh, in fact, Van Thor coming into Surtees he's managed to hop the curb on the inside of the apex. So I get little details like that just make a difference between the momentum being maintained and, uh, and being slightly unsettled. So closing, closing yet again, now coming into Sterling's probably now fractionally under the half-second mark. 
You see the way the gap's been going up between Marcello and, and uh, Niederhauser as Patrick drops away. He falls into the clutches of Dries and Banthorpe. Nicholas Barth is under investigation for causing a collision from the opening lap of the race. And the team manager of that car has to go to the stewards immediately, but nothing at all about the start. So all is good for Marcello, who now leads by a monster margin of 7.7 .7 seconds. He has or is monstering his lead right now. But he's being assisted by Patrick Niederhauser, who's not able now to maintain that pace that he did do in the opening laps. And he's now got Van Dries Van Thor all over the rear, about three tenths or three and a half tenths of a second is the gap. Having gotten himself into this position, where will the momentum take him? Will it be able to take him forward? Or will he now, like often as is the case at Brands Hatch, he gets stalled out behind the, the aero wash from the back of the car he's chasing? Well, there are the two Audis, and I still think key to this battle, key to the outcome, is going to be the pit stop and how quickly WRT can uh, cycle through the mandatory stop relative to Santalot. Because if they're quicker on the pit stops, given the margin between them now is tenths of a second, three tenths starting this lap. If they can be four tenths quicker, they're going to come out ahead. Well, and that's Bob, going to be crucial. Bob would assume they're going to keep Griezmann four in the 32 car for as long as possible. I wouldn't know what Santalot would do with Niederhauser or really Panas. I would think they'd keep Niederhauser in for as long as as well, but we will see as Froggart comes down towards Hawthorns there, ahead of Umbereshku, who is still fending off Neubauer, who in turn has got Dean McDonald behind him. Again, you look at the BOP, all the cars so evenly matched, and because this is not the widest of circuits, it's hard really to dive through and get past. I mean, the natural pace of Niederhauser, of, 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 sorry, Neubauer, and that of uh, the McLaren following behind, Dean McDonald, is quicker than the two Mercedes directly ahead. But again, that's the same story. You can catch, but where are you going to find a way to take that momentum and let it carry you forward? Through clock curve, they come. Dean McDonald's on his toes there, trying to get up the inside of the Audi, but it didn't work. Chris Froggart again just gets away because Neubauer has to go uh, on the attack and Umbreshko on the defensive, coming up towards the line. And actually, this is Neubauer's best chance yet, but he's committed to the outside line. He needs the undercut. Yeah, and I thought Dean McDonald was going to try and slot the McLaren in, get his nose into the inside as they come up. They up the inside. Well, that is going to be. He's made it work. How there wasn't contact between those two cars. Good driving on the part of Umberescu to avoid that. Then you can see <laughs> within the AWR team, they give it an applause. So Vassal Voss sees one of his cars gain a place. And now, look, Dean McDonald tries to get up the inside as well. Umberescu put off line, trying to regroup. And McDonald looks to the inside, but he can't quite do it. Didn't quite have the level of commitment. He, he had the opportunity. He needed to break a little bit later. If it compromises Apex, it doesn't matter. You're going to compromise Umberescu even more. So he's not going to think about all the hard yards once again, going back around the back of the racetrack. This is the Grand Prix loop coming into Westfield Bend. Not really an opportunity to pass with such closely matched cars. Down the dip into Dingledale, then up through Sheen Curve. And you're going to just sit back and wait until you come back out of clearways onto the start finish straight. You're riding on board with Dries Van Thor. That's Patrick Niederhauser ahead. This is Druids. This is lap 15. And they are nose to tail. The gap is down to two tenths of a second between them. Marcello is 9.6 seconds up the road in the race lead. But right now, Dries Van Thor is inching closer and closer and closer. Same type of car. They run out of different teams. Van Thor breaks late going into 30. He gets even nearer to the back of Niederhauser now. Yeah, he took a slightly softer entry into 30s. The Santa Lock Audi hailed out a little bit wider on their point. So the, it's the exit speed of all these corners that really is the key rather than the entry. And if making that softer entry works if you're alongside a car, but not if you're behind it. From Hawthorne up towards Westfield, they turn out of that right hander. The road drops down through Dingledale, climb towards Sheen Curve here. Turn right, ride the curve. And Van Thor just about now is close enough to think about making a move, but to do it, he's got to be brave. But where would you do it? Where would you do it? Do you think, OK, I'll do it down into clearways, but the gap is remaining constant all the way down the short straight into clearways. Next place, going to be up into Paddock Hill Bend. Good exit from Dries Van Thor, who's got the momentum now, but again, Niederhauser is going to hug the inside of the racetrack, forcing Van Thor the long way around, and he can only go so far in the entry into Paddock Hill Bend before he's going to get out of it. Niederhauser's consolidated. Now Van Thor's going to think about going up the inside into Druids, but again, covered off. He's determined to strike, isn't he, as they come now through the corner. Little clip of the curve by Niederhauser. The car twitches slightly, but Van Thor not able to take advantage of that. Downhill, Graham Hill Bend, go left. 
run wide over the curb on the outside. The two Audi skip back onto the circuit. The margin between them at the start of the lap, 0.146 of a second. Go left onto the Grand Prix loop. They could not be closer. Well, I mean, you've got two drivers right on the limit in their respective machines, and Nita has done a very strong job at defence. Dries van Thor has used all his knowledge, all his expertise, and all his natural speed to find a way through, but hasn't been able to make it work. Has dropped back, Mar I mean, talk maybe a metre or so as they come through Westfield. Again, it's about preparation. The preparation is all about the exit of Clareways and Clark Curb. That's going to be the best opportunity, in my view, that uh, Dries van Thor has got. But Nita has not really given them an opportunity. And Niederhauser doing a very, very good job here. You think of the top Audi team really as WRT. Well, it's a Santa Lock car ahead. And Niederhauser is proving to be absolutely the match of Van Thor in all of this. Onto the power. If the move's going to come at Paddock, the next corner, it had to have started. And he's not close enough, is no, it? No, he's not. And that gives Niederhauser an option as to which way he will enter into Paddock and Ben. He can take the traditional line, sweeping from the left across to the right. No defence required this time. Break hard into Druids. We're not far off the pit window opening, but you can anticipate these two to keep on going. Great battle it is between the pair. What it is doing, of course, is serving to allow Marciello to build his lead gap even more. Yes, up to 11 and a half, just over 11 and a half seconds into the WRT pit. Van Sant Vos pointing down the timing and scoring. Charles Berts father, E. Berts, also a wise owl in the WRT pit. Now, I agree with what you were saying earlier about leaving Van Thor in for as long as possible, but I wonder whether they might just roll the dice and get him into the pits early, out of the traffic. If they can't get past on the track, let's roll the dice on the pit stops. Neubauer gets past Froggart, gains another place, goes through, goes 19th. Went very wide on the exit of Graham Hill Bend. Chris Froggart trying to go one way, then the other way as they come up into Surtees. So, having gone through, then he's going to use all the benefits to try and keep the Mercedes behind them, but Mercedes have got good straight line performance all the way down. Ping, Pilgrims drop, then they rise up into Hawthorne. So Mercedes unable to return. But watch Dean McDonald in the, in the McLaren. He has been hovering around the back of Umberescu for pretty much all this race. Cars into the pit lane already. Absolutely. So it's one or two of the Silver Cup or Pro Am entries, but it's Niederhauser as well that comes in. So Patrick Niederhauser and also Jim Pla come in early. Now, that's interesting. Niederhauser in as soon as possible to give way to Aurelian Panis. That surprises me. Jim Pla for Gunon is rather more obvious. Yes, I think it is. Get Gunon behind the wheel. I think that's the right thing to do. Bringing Niederhauser in quite too early. Well, maybe I would have kept him out a little bit longer. So there is the work going on on the 88. So Jules Gunon behind the wheel. Remember, they had a poor pit stop the first race today. That, that was that left rear was the problem, troublesome tyre. So they've got it done. The car's about to start rolling down the pit lane as our race leader continues all the way around the back of the Grand Prix loop. And just looking at this, the 88 Mercedes has got ahead of the Santa Lock Audi. So on the pit stops, Jules Gounon there, look, will come out ahead of Aurelien Panis. So that's what I was saying about WRT. They, they could certainly jump Santa Lock on the pit stops because the ASP Mercedes has done exactly that. Now, the stop from 88 was 43 and a half seconds and from Santa Lock, 52.3. That's a dreadful stop. That's terrible. I mean, you, just, you cannot at this level give away one second, let alone six seconds. So race leader comes across the line to compete. 17 laps goes on, uh, sorry, complete 18 laps goes on. And there is the RD that we saw starting from the pit lane. Good drive all the way through so far from Patrick, uh, Thomas Nordbauer. Indeed so, as the next one for the pits is Dries Van Thor. Now this pit stop is going to be fascinating to see the time thereof. The best pit stop so far in this race is 43 and a half seconds from Aka ASP, sorry, and now Akodis ASP. This year's team name. So Van Thor stops and gets out. Charles Witt will get in. There's 53 Ferrari. Pierre Alexander Jean gives way to Elise de Pau. But anything better than 43 and a half seconds out of Audi number 32, and it's game on. Very much so. The Ferrari likewise in. So Elise de Pau will take over from Pierre Alexander Jean. So that, of course, a service Ferrari is rolling. So interesting to see just where that car's pit stop time is. And for WRT. 41.3 seconds, 41.3, that is 11 seconds quicker than the Santalot pit stop. Ferrari pit stop, 45.2, so they've lost the best part of four seconds to the competition. Indeed, 
but what I was saying about WRT jumping Santa Lock on the pit stops, they've done it with, with time in hand, looking at that. 41.3 against 52 seconds. That is a, well, it's a bonus, basically, yeah. because that's what WRT do so well. Valentino Rossi limbering up for this car. Fred Bavish behind the wheel. Don't think he's going to be coming in quite yet. Probably wait until towards the end of the pit stop window being open before he hands over to Valentino Rossi. But there is Valentino preparing. Yeah. So he will be shortly standing out awaiting the 46 RD making its way into the pits. Well, Vavish carries on. This is the leader, yet to stop. Matteo Drudi, by the way, has taken over number 12 Audi and done an absolute best in the first sector. You're riding now on board with Chris Froggart, who's dropped back into 21st place now as the order continues to shuffle. And there, going through, is Gilles Magnus, who has taken over from Nicholas Bart, uh, against whom no further action is being taken after that earlier incident. OK, well, that's considered a racing incident. Certainly, it virtually, if not for all three wheels, off the racetrack on the entry into Grey Mill Bend, but that's the judgment, and uh, on we go. So, Chris Frogger thunders down once again. Pilgrim's drop onto the new surface in, through Hawthorne's. The track beginning to show signs of actually changing colour, the very dark, the black almost tarmac, the new tarmac beginning to get scuffed, and that will give drivers confidence and, and also a margin more grip. So, Raffaele Marciello goes through, does another lap, that's 20 in the book. Now, he is lapping at the moment in the 23s as Christian Clean's car there is running in third place overall, yet to stop, and he's trying to find a way past Chris, uh, sorry, Eddie Cheever now, who has taken over number 93, he goes to the outside. They're on different laps, and Christian Clean gets up the inside, or does he? So the third place McLaren versus the 21st place Mercedes after its pit stop, and through goes Clean. Yeah, that's pretty easy for Christian Clean. He worked it out where he was going to be better, and that was at the exit of clearways and Clark Kerr got the run, got up inside of the Mercedes and then took over the control of Paddock Hill Bend. Now, Raffaele Marciello still has the fastest lap of the race. Christian Clean here, third overall, leading in Pro-Am, of course, where Andrea Bertolini is second, Cedric Sprazioli, both Ferrari drivers, are second and third and fourth, Dean McDonald in the McLaren. Valley is ready to go. The doctor will see you now because he's awaiting his Audi. Yes, indeed, and uh, you was know, sanding their hands on hips, where's my car? Well, it's going on to another <laughs> lap, so at the end of this lap, which is going to be lap 21, we'll see Fred Bavish come into the pits. By the time he gets to the pit stop, the seat belts will not be unbuckled, but the straps will be loosened. If you unbuckle them, that's a penalty. So the Audi press is on. There you've got Eddie Cheever still going for points in the Silver Cup in class as he turns through Sheen Curve. And that's the overall winning and indeed Silver Cup winning Ferrari of earlier on in the day. So now Ulysse de Pau is at the wheel. The order, of course, is somewhat shuttled with some having stopped and others not. But number 25 there, the Santa Lock Audi, has fallen way, way back. Aurelien Pan is now behind Jean-Baptiste Simonau. So that really slow pit stop has cost them dear. Yes, I mean, a good work done by Nita Hauser to end up having a loss of six seconds against your principal competitors of the same manufacturer is something that uh, the team need to address. And a lot more practice to Fred Bavish on doing the seat belts, loosening the shoulder straps and all the other little accoutrements in the cockpit. Now, Valentino gets to the door, opens it up, assists Fred Bavish, get out, there we go. Now, get the seat belts attached, get the shoulder straps across, get the lap belt attached. That is also incorporating the crutch straps. So Fred Bavish, considerable might have been, uh, tightened the shoulder straps, Valentino. You can't do it when you're driving down the pit lane. But you see how well drilled that stop was, and the car is waved away. Fred Bavisius, he was unhappy because yeah. they lost maybe a, maybe up to two seconds, but certainly one second, by not being quite on the ball, getting the car rolling. 43.4 seconds. Now, who's that? Whoa. That Porsche. is an Audi, and that oh, is the car that was in 11th place. That's Simonau. That's Jean-Baptiste Simonau, who's gone way, way wide at Paddock. So that drops him behind. Aurelien Panis, and is that the leader in? It is. Raffaele Marciello then arrives with Timo Bogoslavski set to take over. But now the pit stop and Bogoslavski's pace will dictate the outcome of the race. Yes, this should be, let's watch and see the pit stop time. 41.3 is the best time we've seen to date. That was for the WT, uh, WRT RD20 number 32. So Bogoslavski in, Raffaele Marciello having done a stunning job in his stint. So clock still ticking by rolling as it moves down to the end of the pit lane. 
So it's, it's going to be stop. not as quick as the WRT. No. 43, 44, wow. 45, 46. Oh. It's not as decent as I thought. 46.4 seconds. Disappointingly slow time for the Mercedes, but they had such an advantage. Christian Clean, by the way, in the lead for his last lap before he makes the way into the pits. So he gets the honor of leading a silver cup car. Right, it's game on, because now Timur Bogoslavsky is being chased by Charles Wirtz. And this is exactly what I was thinking. If WRT could jump Santa Luck on the stops, which they've done, we know that Wirtz is quick, and now he's hunting down uh, Bogoslavsky, who's got to get himself up to speed, and who has lost time anyway, because his uh, pit stop was, what, five seconds, 5.3 seconds slower. So they've already lost a chunk of time against number 32 Audi. This is going to make the second part of this race really interesting. Christian Clean must be coming in at the conclusion of this lap. So it comes down into Clearways. Wait to see. Yes, he does. So he's in. Yeah. So that's pretty much the field has now made their way into the pits. So at the end of the lap, we need to see a gap between Timo Wagoslowski and Charles Wirtz. That's going to give us the indication of what we can expect for 25 minutes and a bit because the clock ticks on down. The window is nearly closing. There is Bogoslowski then. So he's into the car, he's got to get himself up to speed. Now, he's a quick driver, he's perhaps not the quickest, but he's quick, and he comes across the line now. And more importantly, on these opening laps, he has clear racetrack ahead of him. He's not having to deal with cars that are coming out after their pit stops or people he's got to catch and lap. There is the second place, in effect, Charles Wirtz, and followed now by Jules Gugnon in the Mercedes number 88. Right, 9.6 seconds is the margin. So it's Bogoslavski ahead of Wirtz, ahead of Gunon. And 9.6, the lead gap, that is the one to focus on right now. There goes Patrick Kropinski out of the pit lane, hoping to hang on to the lead of Pro-Am. Now, we look at sector times. Bogoslowski gets to the end of the first sector, 26 and a half. And Charles Wirtz, 26 and a half, actually 100 slower in the Audi. Yeah, as, I think as long as uh, Bogoslowski is able to run in clear air, unaffected by other traffic, he will have a very strong pace to the end of this race. This issue will come when he catches up to back markers. Yeah. Will he be courageous enough or aggressive enough to find his way through? Through goes Gunon in third place. That's Simon Gachet in fourth. And he has taken over from Christopher Hauser. Fifth is the Ferrari of Ulysse de Pau and sixth, Aurelien Panis. So that's the answer to how much it costs Antelot. Second when they pitted and sixth when the window closes. So, Dries Van Thor has handed over to Charles Witt. He can reflect on his stint and his chances for the second stint as well. He's in conversation with Gemma. Dries, we saw you push very, very hard again in that stint. How difficult was that for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it was a bit too, it's too difficult to overtake here. I think uh, their pressure were a bit high, I think, in the beginning, so they could pull a gap, and our pressures came up, and we could close the gap again, but then I'm stuck, you know, and then... Um, yeah, then you're stuck, so you can't really do a lot. And uh, luckily, our strategy was strong enough to, to get them in the pit stop. Then the, the crew did a mega pit stop. Hopefully, we can keep second. Uh, first, we will not reach. I think uh, the Merc was, was flying uh, the second race. So, um, yeah, we uh, hopefully we can still 20 minutes or so to go. So, uh, we just have to keep the fingers crossed. Charles brings it through. Thank you very much. Well, Charles Wirtz is going the right way about it because 9.6 has become 9.5 seconds. Uh, but the Mercedes, I think, is better around the first sector on the Indy circuit. Out here on the back part of the lap, the Audi seems to, to work better. But around the Indy circuit section in sector one, where you've got perhaps more uh, of the torque needed from the front engine Mercedes AMG, that's where Bogoslowski seems to have the advantage. Well, he's got a, a comfortable nine and a half second lead. And Charles Vetch was hunting him down. Charles Vetch needs to be on his toes because just under three seconds behind is Jules Gugnon in the 88 Mercedes. And that is also a car capable, if it should catch the back of the 32 Audi, to focus the concentration backwards for Vetch rather than forward trying to run down Bogoslavski. There is the Jota McLaren that has now been taken over uh, by, for this second stint of the race, Ollie Wilkinson. And that is in 12th spot. The McLarens went well here last year, but the fastest this season has been the JP Motorsport car in the hands of Christian Clean. Now, there is the leading Mercedes, and the gap from 9.6 to 9.5 has gone back up to 9.6. So you could argue now that all Tim Bogoslavski has to do for 22 minutes is bring it home, just not make mistakes. Yeah, I mean, I say, on his own in clear air, 
he has got really good pace and he's illustrated that because the gap when they joined the field was around about nine and a half nine point six seconds it's still in that zone so he's not losing anything to Charles Fertz who one might assume of the two drivers might be the naturally more quick yeah. but there is Fertz coming through Hawthorne's now getting onto the brakes going into Westfield and then accelerates out but is pushing as hard as he can you can see there's nothing left he's right out to the very edge of the curbing and all there is after that is grass and that grass is now damp so you don't want to take the chance at rooting a rear wheel onto it because you will be in trouble. The absolute top speeds you can see there, it's not necessarily those drivers that have done them, but number 111 when Christian Clean was driving the McLaren, the fastest through the speed trap at 251 kilometers an hour, Raffaele Marchiello 249. But fascinating to see some of the cars further down the order, very, very quick through the speed trap. Yeah, that's the quickest speed we've seen all day, all weekend, in fact, 251 kilometers. And interesting, the 89 Mercedes just two kilometres down. Important to have good straight line speed, but certainly the McLaren, Christian Clean, 251. And he'll be happy with that. Now, Charles Wirtz to Jules Gounon, only 2.4 seconds, but that Audi, going back to what you were saying, leaving nothing on the table, it, it looks a fast car, but it's just not being reflected in the gap. Now, this is Aurelien Panis versus Matteo Drudi. This is for sixth, and Matteo Drudi in the car collection Audi, right on the back of the Santa Lock car here. Indeed, and this is going to be a little bit of a stretch for Rillian Panis because there's no question Matteo Drudi is one of the, I mean, to me, impressive drivers, the young drivers coming through the Audi family. So Rillian Panis, although he's got all the right genes, uh, doesn't matter. Matteo Drudi is a young, quick Italian driver. So the fight for sixth rages on through Hawthorns. The overall lead gap not changing. It's stuck at nine and a half seconds as there. Panis 6th, Drudy 7th, turns through the right of Westfield. The road plunges down through Dingle Dell, a resurface section up towards Sheen Curve. That is Valentino Rossi, 8th place. I think there's a benefit in the pit stop to get him in and out very quickly. Nevertheless, it's about position, position, position. So all Valentino has to do, he's got cars closing on him. He's got the 38 and the 87. So Keep your focus ahead of you. Be aware that there's traffic coming. It may well be catching you, but we've only got 19 minutes of this race to run. You can stay in that position, but don't be forced into making an error. To the timing line he comes. The Lamborghini up the road ahead is a back marker anyway, so actually Valentino Rossi's next target would be Matteo Drudi, who is eight seconds up the road, and he's not lapping as quickly, understandably, because he's relatively new to this type of car. But when he catches the tail of the Lamborghini, he needs to catch, overtake, move on. Yeah. If he allows himself to be trapped behind the back, then he's going to be subsumed by those that are following behind him. The lead gap has gone up to 9.8 seconds, by the way, as we look at Valentino Rossi. It's a good scrap going on behind him as well, where we've got Simonau and Drouet together. So uh, Charles Witz falling away from Bogdanovski, but Valentino Rossi here using every lap to add to his arm reach. More knowledge, more seat time, more learning. I mean, I think what Valentino Rossi needs is to get into a real you know, bare-knuckle fight. Forget about thinking about it, just do it. Yeah. Well, there, 87, Tom Adrue is doing it because he's got onto the back of Jean-Baptiste Simonau, and he's taking with him Nicolas Scherl as well. So you've got Silver Cup Mercedes, Silver Cup Audi on the back of the Pro Cup Audi there. The blue and white car, Jean-Baptiste Simonau at the wheel of that car, having taken over from Christopher Meese. It started. Uh, on the outside of the fourth row. So it's lost one place as Valentino Rossi kicks up the dirt at the and corner the, he went off at yesterday. The Lamborghini directly ahead likewise kicked up a little bit more than Rossi did. There's this group of cars are all sort of again lasering in to the back of the 46 ID. But Rossi currently keeping them sufficiently in bay. They're probably closing maybe a couple of tenths of that but uh, he's not made any errors, he's driven cleanly. His bent noir will be when he gets to the tail of the Lamborghini. That will be then the first occasion he's got to use all his racing guile. So just under 18 minutes to go is there. He's at Tutumlu, a lap down, runs wide out of Graham Hill Bend. He is being caught by, by Valentino Rossi. So eighth place, Fred Vervich again having done a really good opening stint, a good pit stop as well, helping, and the race now he's on lap number 29 Valentino Rossi who of course has never raced anything at Brands Hatch hustles on down to Hawthorns the gaps coming down second to third as well just further up the road Gunon closing on Wirtz yeah I'm not really surprised to see that because you can see how good the Mercedes is with Bogoslowski and Marcello with that comfortable gap 
and then the 88 car, the sister car, Jules Gomez behind the wheel, who was pretty impressive in qualifying on, on Saturday morning. Well, Rossi has caught the GSM Nova Marine Lamborghini, which should get out of the way, and it holds its line, the blue light flashes on the bridge, so Valentino around the outside, puts a lap on to Tumblu and goes through. And more importantly, he's now got a car between himself and the pursuing three cars. Again, that's he got cleanly through at an important part of the racetrack, didn't lose any momentum. When the other three catch up, it'll be partly where they catch. And they are battling amongst themselves, so their focus will be on taking advantage of each other, at the same time not putting themselves in a disadvantaged position. So there, down towards Hawthorns, goes the second-placed Audi. And Charles Wirtz turns through Hawthorne. There is Jules Gounon hunting him down. This is Gounon's view. Heads towards Westfield now, turns right, rattles the kerb. He's creeping up onto the back, the gap 1.6 seconds. But you can sense the frustration from Wirtz because he's on the limit, but he just can't do anything about Bogoslowski. He's not even eating into it, the gap's going up. Uh, yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> we are in agreement. Down towards Clearways then comes the Audi. So Wirtz turns through, uh, Ulista Powell's done a personal best lap in the Ferrari. I mean, he's been, uh, again, with Pierre-Alexandre Jean, standout this weekend. I mean, uh, one of the most enjoyable weekends in terms of what they have course have done, just to see that car win mm -hmm. the first call, uh, first of the sprint races, and running strong there, particularly with Ulysses de Powell behind the wheel. He's got Simon Gachet ahead of him, with just about three seconds. Probably not enough time remaining, 15 minutes to go, to take a meaningful lunge at the uh, fourth place number 11 Audi. Yeah, traditionally AF Corsa run, if you like, customer cars in the classes in Pro-Am. They've had huge success in those classes, but an outright win for an AF Corsa car in uh, Fanatec GT is something unusual and it's been good to see. Right, second and third, 1.4 seconds that margin, lead gap 9.7 seconds as Bogoslowski does exactly the right thing, just does metronomically good laps, doesn't make mistakes. Yeah, and he's been able to run his pace he's not been interfered with back markers so what now this is six this, yeah. this is rudy on the back of panis here and this is for position and it could come to a head right now because those two could not be closer and you can see the amount of pressure that matthew drudy is applying to aurelian panis santa lock versus car collection the teams operating these cars right on the rear bumper of the santa lock Audi. but again you catch where you're going to pass the best place again there's always going to be a good exit on the clearways, you can't do very much around this part of the racetrack. So into Sterling's band, just don't overdrive, don't overrun the exit. Sorry, Matteo really marginally overran it, but probably not losing too much time. But he needed to be a little bit closer here to be able to then get any advantage he might have getting through the exit of Clark Curve, then up the hill into Paddockle Bend. He's not been able to achieve that, in part because of that exit under Sterling's. Out of Paddock Hill Bend, they turn, so Aurelian Panis stretches that advantage after that little tiny error by Matteo Drudi. Timo Bogoslowski, 9.4 seconds to the good. He's come down a little bit, but I think this is him driving within himself, as you see Ulysse de Pau in fifth, heading for another Silver Cup win, way up the road from the Silver Cup opposition. And this car has marked itself out to be one to watch for the rest of our Sprint Cup season. And there is the car directly ahead, Timo Gachet. So that's where Ulysse de Pau is looking albeit he's leading the Silver Cup by a country mile. He uh, wants to get maybe, well, fourth place would be nice, a podium would be even better, but unfortunately, Gachet is seven and a half seconds behind Gugno, so a third place, unless something untoward happens. Well, Fred Vervish and Valentino Rossi's Audi is the fastest car on this section of circuit, up towards Sheen Curve at 164 kilometers an hour. The leading Mercedes, the second fastest, the second placed Audi is the third in terms of the speed up to Sheen Curve, which has caught out far fewer people in race two than race one. Certainly has on board of Valentino as he comes down Dingle Dell, swoops up the hill into Sheen Curve, and being caught some an hour. Thomas Drouet and Nicholas Schull all getting that little bit closer lap by lap to the rear of the 46 Audi. So Valentino Rossi then is hard at work. You saw a study of concentration on his face. And that is Patrick Krupinski leading still in Pro-Am, but almost undoing Christian Klein's good work there by running way wide at Paddock Hill Bend. But he's back on the racetrack. Yeah, he got a, a load of dirt on those left side tyres, front and rear. So. This is Drudy still doing all he can to find a way around Aurelio Panis. 
So tries a different entry into Surtees to give a later apex to get a better run, pick up the speed, but again, not sufficiently close to the rear of the 50, uh, 25. Audi again pulls out just to sort of show the nose of his car and the mirrors of Panis's car, just trying to affect his concentration. But Panis is not making mistakes, and it was Drudy a lap ago that did make a mistake. You see how the cars hop there through Westfield. Touch the curb, it unsettles them a little bit. This is the resurface section up towards Sheen Curve, that flat curb on the inside. Of course, Brands Hatch, a busy motorbike circuit these days for British superbikes, so the curbs have to tolerate cars and bikes. Better exit this time for Drudy out of Sterling. And is he any closer? I think he is a little closer this time in clearways, so he's about to try and launch an attack. But again, a good exit from Panis, likewise. As there is Ulysse de Pau. Now, his target of Simon Gachet is only a second and a half up the road. The Ferrari still looking good, as you see there. Wits and Gounon, 1.2 seconds. But again, Jules kind of stuck as well. He's, he's talking about hundreds per lap now. And that is Timo Bogoslavski, who you can almost picture with one hand on the window sill and changing the track on the CD because he's got such a comfortable lead. Rafael Marchiello looks pretty relaxed about this. Or even eating a chicken wing. Yes. <laughs> Last warning to Charles Wirtz for track limits. So the car in second place. Oops, some big drama there for Jean-Baptiste Simonard at Druids. He's had a, a lose. He gets back into the race, but that's cost him a fair few places. How did he do it? Let's see. Uh, was that on his, uh, on his own, or was there an assist? There was. No, he, well, there yes. was an assist indeed. There was. Thomas Druid in the Mercedes clobbered into the rear of the Audi. Maybe he'd done a little bit of damage to the nose of the Mercedes, and hopefully didn't damage the diffuser in the back of the Audi. That might be also under review. I would think so. Tomo Druids rather than Tomo Druid. Anyway, this is Charles Wirtz, who is second as he comes up towards the timing line. Uh, Timo Bogoslavski, long gone. And in fairness to Jules Gounon's efforts, he just can't really do enough against that Audi. They get 1.3 seconds, 10 minutes to go. But Timo Bogoslavski, thanks to Raffaele's great efforts in the first stint, looks as though he's on target for the relatively easy win. That's third, that's Gounon, still pushing though. Yeah, the last maybe just about a tenth of a second on the last lap over the previous. Nevertheless, you've got this last minute, ten minute push. So maybe he just decided to think about it, consolidate, and allow himself the, the, the opportunity to, to make that sort of momentum, build up that momentum again, to try to get within a second of the rear of the 32 ID. So down two, Hawthorne's goes Jules Gounon. Brakes, drops a gear, turns right, back onto the power, hauls it out of the corner, rides the curb on the outside, and now towards Westfield. The Akodis ASP Mercedes turns through the right-hander, and up towards Sheen Curve now on this lap number 35 at Brands Hatch. So into Sheen Curve, out of Sheen Curve, you're in and out of it so quickly. Then Sterling's a corner that often people overdrive, particularly on the exit. You don't want to drop that wheel off. So a good exit both from the Audi and from the Mercedes. And, and Matteo Drudy still stuck behind Aurelia Panis. Runs way wide again in the exit of Sheen, manages to get tucked back in again. Don't run wide in the exit of... Uh, again, he's going to be in a good position coming down into clearways. I mean, not quite as close as he's been on a couple of laps ago, but that's where he needs to be. Well, Matthew Drudy is the fastest man on the approach to Paddock, but tied with Aurelian Panis and Raffaele Marchiello's Mercedes. So 175 kilometers an hour on the approach to Paddock. That illustrates how evenly matched these two cars are. They run out of different teams. The same base car, the uh, Audi R8 LMS GT3 Euro 2, but they are absolutely tied together with eight minutes to go. Yeah, and further down the field, Ulysse de Paul is only now a second behind Simon Gachet in fourth place. That's a battle that's going on directly ahead of these two Audis. They go into Surtees, then lap 36. Of course, the first race punctuated by that early safety car period, so we've had more racing laps in this, even allowing for the extra formation lap. As the two Audis turn through, sixth and seventh, it is Mercedes, Audi, Mercedes, Audi, Ferrari, Audi, 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 Mercedes, Audi, within the top ten. Both of them up the kerb. Drudy taking more liberties. That is Rossi. He is still in eighth. But behind him is Tom Drue, and we saw how aggressive he could be up at Druids a few laps ago. So Valentino will be looking in his mirrors, keeping an eye on the road ahead. He's got a clear road ahead, so his focus is now very much on the Mercedes running behind, and then Nicholas Schull in the 99, Ardy directly behind the Mercedes. So under pressure for a top 10 finish for the 46 Ardy here this afternoon. 
Now, Tom Adrue has pretty easily caught up onto the tail of Valentino Rossi, who, in fairness, has had an awful lot to learn this weekend, partly about sprint racing, but partly about brands, because this is all new to him, whether it's in a car or on a bike. He's never raced here on anything. Up toward the line he comes. Drouet still chasing, seven minutes to go. Clock ticks on down as through they come. Behind the pair of them is Nicholas Scherl's Audi. Jean-Baptiste Simonau bumped down into 14th after that tangle at Druids a couple of laps back. A little bit wide in, in Paddock Bend and Valentino Rossi getting something he's not been accustomed to. That's headlights flashing in his mirrors. You don't get that on a Moto GP. Oh no, oh no. So if he wasn't concentrating before, he sure will be now. Of course, he has done some uh, racing before. He's been a regular in. Uh, Gulf 12 hours. He has done some rallying. We've had him in the uh, Endurance Championship many, many years ago at the Nervo Ring in a Ferrari. So it's not entirely new, but the circuit is. And of course, the Audi is a new car for him for this year. But he's being urged on by all the Rossi faithful who are dotted all around the Indy circuit. Yeah, the fans have come out in strength to watch the hero. Because I'm seeing him on two wheels. Here he is through Hawthorne's. And there are the grands. Well, this place has been a sea of yellow. Yeah. Whenever you look, it's been yellow and blue. 46 is the number. Any other number? Get out of here. Absolutely. And won't be tied Tom Adrue if he makes contact with the doctor because he'll break it out here alive. Uh, up towards Sterling's comes Valentino Rossi. Ardent fans there seeing each other uh, on the big screens around the circuit. But Valentino Rossi doesn't have time to look at any of that. He is focused on keeping number 46 Audi ahead of Tom Adrue's Mercedes right there behind him. You know, sometimes when you're under pressure like this, you actually drive better than if you're driving around with mm. nobody around you. Now he's got a focal, a focus point. He's got that Mercedes behind him. Look at this Mercedes directly behind second place Audi. And that gap is now down to just under 0.6 of a second. Into Hawthorns they come with five minutes to go for second and third places. So with Jules Gounon having another push, we might, might, might be on for a Mercedes 1-2 here for a Codis ASP. Gounon has certainly not settled for third, has he? No, he did drop back momentarily, and now he's regained that momentum. There's no point hanging in behind the rear wing of another car. You need to sometimes drop back, pick up your own natural pace, and then make another attack. That, to me, is what Gunnar has been doing. Absolutely right. Here he comes, then. This is the run down towards Clearways into Clark Curve. The clock ticks on down. The Audi sprints towards the line. Speed building to 60. And you're looking back from Wits at Jules Gounon and the margin six tenths of a second. And as you look back from the Audi, in the box at the top right of the screen is Gounon's view up towards Druid. Brake change down, turn in. The margins are so fine between these two cars. One little mistake, a little bit wider. Had a kill bend a little bit too early in the brakes, or too late normally in the case. So these two have got, what, seven tenths of a second. Six tenths of a second, right, but seven seconds between second and first. So the gap has come down to first and second, but with only four minutes remaining, it's almost now academic who's going to win the race, but who's going to come second and who's going to come third, far from being academic. Well, Timo Bogoslowski, seven seconds to the good. The margin has come down a little bit, but that's him just backing off and making sure he gets to the end safely. But for second and third, it's going to go down to the wire. Gunon all over the back of Wirtz here. Jim Plough started, gave way to Jules early. Dries Van Thorn giving way to Charles Wirtz. And look, the two of them are together as out of Sterling's goes the race leader through traffic. So Bogoslavski being careful here. He's got two more cars to negotiate. Three and a half minutes, certainly two more laps. As Eddie Cheever there in the Mercedes gets past the Porsche, the surviving Porsche, which is Giorgio Roda's car. Yeah, Bogoslavski will want to clear the Porsche, certainly. On the way up into Druids, he's going to get that done pretty easily. The Porsche runs wide. So that's an easy pass. Next car up is the 93 Sky Tempesta. Eddie Cheever on board. One would assume that he'll be aware that the car now behind him is the race leader. And he will not make life difficult for the race leader. They're all a part of one big family known as Mercedes-Benz. Absolutely right. So there through the traffic has gone Timo Bogoslaski. Uh, the gap's down to six seconds, but of course all the back markers that have delayed him will delay the others because the second and third place cars have got to fight away through as well. Half a second was all it was between Wits and Gunon. That's Giorgio Roda, a lap down, and he, in turn, has got Miguel Ramos and then Hugo Delacour behind him. Now, this is looking back from Wirtz. That is still Jules Gounon menacingly close behind, but Jules is just not quite, quite, quite able to get there behind him. You can catch, and then he gets into that sort of wash, that dirty air from the back of the Audi, and that sort of plateaus out. 
the attack that Gunnar has been planning all the way through. Takes a lot of curb on the inside coming into Sheen. That gave a marginal advantage to Clues down the back of the Audi. Wants to get again as close as possible from the now and the entry into Clearways. Of course, they've still got those three back markers to deal with. So Gunnar ought to be fractionally closer when they come across start finish line to complete lap 39. A lap ago, Gunnar made a small error at Druids, so he cost himself a little bit of time. He's trying to make that back up again. So we've got time for two more laps in the race. Through they turn. Wide, skimming the gravel at Paddock Hill Bend. Climb the hill once more up towards Druids. The attention is on for second place. Charles Witt just ahead of Jules Gunnar. The badge has been under considerable pressure pretty much all the way through a stint. A little bit wide at the bottom of Graham Hill Bend. But then Gunnar runs very wide on the exit, so that he needs to be careful of. Doesn't need more notifications about track limit abuses. Makes a late, late cut to get his apex on the exit of Surtees. So maybe he thinks for well, one minute and 16 seconds remaining, that's going to be the end of this lap, and then one final lap. I'm not giving up. Yeah, Jules Gunnar knowing that he's got one more lap to go at the end of this. He's trying everything he can to unsettle Charles Wirtz, who did make a mistake in the first race at Sheen Curve. Over the curves they go there. Wow, did he ever go over the curve? He had two wheels right inside the curve. And all thought that's the first time I've seen anybody do that here this weekend. That saves Gunnar on the 10th. He'll take it into Sterling's now. The race leader will be starting the last lap this time, and Wirtz does go wide. It's Tony Dahl, so that's third on the right-hand side tires. OK, we're going through the right-hand corner. But again, it's an indication that how close both these drivers are to the ragged edge. Yeah. And again, those three cars directly ahead are any, is one of them or any of the three going to come into play? That would be the biggest nightmare right now for Charles Betts. So there they are. Giorgio Roda goes through ahead of Miguel Ramos, ahead of Hugo Delacour. The leader has picked his way through, but unwittingly, these back markers might, might, might change the situation for second place. Because if you encounter one at exactly the wrong moment, that might give an opportunity to the car behind. Let's see. Gunon is closer than ever before now. Charles Wirtz is going to try and time this absolutely right. Bogoslavski is away and gone up the road, though. He's clear. He's got no pressure whatsoever. So Charles Vance, 6.2 seconds behind, but he's thinking more about what's going on behind me. He's got a little fraction of a breathing space, this camera on board of a long lens, so the actual gap look, where you sit here and looking in the rear view, this time you'll go on not being as uh, aggressive into Hawthorne. Nothing he can do. There is our race leader. And soon to be race winner, Timo Bogoslavski carrying on. Raffaele Marciello's good work. Here they come after. Mechanical maladies scuppered potential wins last year. This has been an absolutely perfect day, certainly as far as race two is concerned. The car then now comes down towards clearways at Clark Curve. We're looking back from the Charles Wirtz Audi. We'll come back to it in a moment because, first of all, there's a chequered flag at the ready. There's an Akodis ASP win for Timor Bogoslavski and Raffaele Marciello, who win at Brands Hatch. Here is second and third. They're together in the traffic, but Charles Wirtz has just done enough. He is second. Jules Gounon is third. And the margin was 0.273 of a second, but Raffaele Marciello is delighted. And Dries van Thor has to at least accept second place and the points, which are going to be crucial during the year. Very important for WRT. They didn't win the race. They probably weren't going to win this race, but importantly, they secured second place. And you can see Vance van Thor absolutely delighted. But here's another battle continuing on as well. The checkered flag may be out for the winner, but halfway yeah. through the final lap. Now, Benji Goethe has got ahead of Patrick Krupinski then. And you've got Gilles Magnus in the red and black out and looking for a way through as well. So 16th, 17th and 18th. We've had one change on the last lap. Krupinski there has dropped back, but in a way it doesn't matter. He's after the pro-am points, so in a way he could let Magnus go. Just make sure he banks the points for the class win. Gilles Magnus right there behind him, but uh, Krupinski, who gets better every time out, fending him off as they come down towards Clark Curve. And ahead of them, Benji Goethe at 17th after starting at the back and, of course, with an elongated pit stop as a penalty. Yeah, I think starting at the back maybe wasn't the biggest problem. That extra 10 seconds station in the pit lane on top of your pit stop, that hurts, that really does hurt. And they're finishing in eighth place, Valentino Rossi. And eighth in this company is certainly no disgrace. I think he'd be very, very happy indeed. <laughs> you can see giving his love to the TV viewers, to the fans around the racetrack. He needs a race like this, yeah. where it is, it is a combative kind of racing. These sprint rounds, there is no time to do anything other than just focus on what you're doing. But uh, he will be happy with eighth place. Well, Raffaele Marciello is a very happy race winner, and so too is his co-driver, Timo Bogoslavski. 
And uh, you might have thought on paper that a gunon pla combination was stronger, but it's Bogoslavski and Marcello that take a race win. And Bogoslavski did everything perfectly in that stint, didn't he? He did. He did have the benefit of having relatively clear air around him for nearly all of his stint. There's only when he came up behind a couple of back markers. So he used that to... His strength is running on his own. Well, Timo Bogoslavski and Raffaele Marcello are our race winners. Six and a half seconds was the margin in the end, but uh, I think that was Timo making sure he got it home safely. Let's hear their thoughts now though with Gemma. Raffaele, you seem to set up a perfect stint there for Timo. An incredible, I think, 11 seconds you were ahead at one point. Yeah, as I said, the car felt good all the weekend. I think I did P1 in every practice and two fastest laps, so I mean, it means the car was, yeah, was mega. Timur, since, since Kialami, is also mega quick, so I mean, uh, he's doing a mega job, the car is mega, so I, I look forward to, yeah, to me, to Manicuria. Absolutely, well done, a fantastic race. Timur, you must have enjoyed that. Yeah, so yes, there was her birthday, I take 22, and uh, Rafael made a perfect present for me, so he gave me a ball and uh, that's more than 10 seconds gap. So, but yeah, car was mega, I was... Uh, drive like maximum easily and without any dangerous moves so to save the tires maybe because of the safety car or some that happens but yeah everything is good so thank you very much well done congratulations so a very good birthday present wasn't it after uh, his birthday yesterday Timo Bogostowski takes the win and as I say although the margin was down a bit that was really him just backing off to make sure that uh, the car came home well and the more seat time he has the quicker he will get so doing good lap times during that stint. Charles Wirtz and Dries Van Thor then finishing in second place and I think they're going to be a bit frustrated with that but they know how to win championships and so the points are going to be crucial for Charles and Dries. <laughs> Charles <laughs> Taking in the fans there and enjoying it, but my goodness, you were per certainly pressured there. Yeah, for sure. Like, like we said, since the beginning of the weekend, we knew that uh, we didn't have the, the fastest car, but um, yeah, definitely a lot of pressure coming from uh, from Jules. But uh, yeah, we managed to, to not make any mistakes, to stay in front, which was the, the big deal here on this track. As we said before the race, advantage is a difficult place to overtake, so without a real mistake, it's almost impossible. So yeah, really happy again. We're on position in the in the pit stop. So again, congrats to WLT. Thanks a lot for everything. And uh, yeah, that's a good start of the season. That certainly was a mega pit stop, and, and it just changed everything. Yeah, it did. I mean, uh, we, we we boxed P3, we came out P2. So uh, Charles did a good job getting uh, dealing with the pressure at the end. Uh, yeah, I was close with the, with the truck limit at one stage, but uh, he did well. And uh, yeah, I think it was maximum for us. Uh, P1 today, uh, in this race again, was, was not reachable for us. So um, on to the next with, one. We're happy with two times second, exactly. Congratulations, well done. Great race. I think actually interesting the comments from both drivers. But in reality, if that 32 Audi had been in the lead at the start, that would have won the race, in my opinion. Yeah, I think you're probably right. So uh, frustration, but points. And uh, let's hear next from our third placed crew because uh, Jim Pla and Jules Gounon are with Gemma. Boys, that was a, an outstanding result. Jules, just talk to us about those last few laps there. You had so much pressure on Charles. Yeah, I had a lot of sand from him in my eyes still, but uh, it was a good fight. I was really looking forward for the traffic. So unfortunately, it was one lap to shy uh, the checkered front because I think with the traffic could have been a crazy battle, you know, traffic of Quam in front and, and with us. But I gave it all. I think we catch back, but wasn't enough. Good result P4 this morning, P3 this afternoon. Good point for the championship for Jim. And uh, yeah, we are still happy. Absolutely. And great to see the car performing well. I know it wasn't an easy weekend throughout. No, no, it's, it's, quite, it's quite difficult this weekend because it's really short, you know, uh, everything happened on, on Saturday, so, but yeah, uh, we scored good points, uh, I took a good start uh, to, to be P4 and uh, Jules did the job at the end, so yeah, really happy to, to score some good points for the championship. Congratulations, thanks boys. So they will make their way to the podium and uh, a, a job well done in difficult circumstances in a way for Mercedes team because the car didn't really perform as well as it should at the start of the weekend. They had to get around that problem. Timor Bogoslavski and Raffaele Marciello win a brand's hatch from Charles Witz and Ries Van Thor with Jules Gounon and Jim Parr taking third. Good result for fourth. Timon Gachet and Christopher Hauser ahead of the race one winners, Ulysse Depau and Pierre-Alexandre Jean.
Six, Laurelian Panis and Patrick Niederhauser. The second of the silvers, Tom Audrey and Casper Stevenson. Uh, ninth and the third of them, Nicholas Sherl and Alex Arca. Tenth overall. As far as Pro-Am is concerned, 17th was the winning car there. The JP Motorsport McLaren of Christian Kleen and Patrick Krabinski. The second of those in Pro-Am, Louis Machiels and Andrea Bertolini, ahead of the Garage 59 McLaren of Miguel Ramos and Dean McDonald. But Raffaele Marciello and Timor Bogostowski made that look pretty easy as they stormed clear to win the second Panatec GT Sprint Cup race of the season. Let's have a look at the highlights of that race. And this was the key lap because it was a good start by Marciello and he just stormed away from the rest of them as the cars turned their way through Paddock Hill Bend for the first time. He came out of the right-hander with a good three or four lengths advantage and straight away the opposition was on the back foot. He left everybody else scrapping over second, third, fourth places. Drama on the opening lap that turned around Gerhard Trevalza as uh, then Nicholas Barth got into the Lamborghini. No further action was taken, but we lost with suspension dramas. Christian Engelhardt coming out of Paul Falls. Bad weekend for the Porsches, but this was to be a good race for Mercedes. After a delayed start from the back of the grid, Thomas Neubauer was threading his way through the traffic as well. And so too was Dries Van Thor closing onto the back of the Santalock Audi of Patrick Niederhauser. But a really bad pit stop from Santalock would change the order there. Thomas Neubauer still attacking as he carved his way through the field. And Dries Van Thor waited for the mechanics to complete the tyre activity before he bailed out of the way and sent Charles Witt back into the race. The race one winning Ferrari was on target for another good result as Christian Kleen doing the start stint in 1-1-1. One, one, one. McLaren hustled his way up the order. He would lead briefly as Fred Verbeesh came to the pits to give way to Valentino Rossi. After a slow pit stop, the Santa Lock Audi had fallen back into the clutches with Aurelian Panis at the wheel of it into Matteo Drudis. Uh, Prey, and he was looking for a way by as Krupinski ran out wide coming out of Paddock Hill Bend in the McLaren. Matthew Drudy was trying everything he could to get ahead of the Santa Lock car seat, but it just wouldn't work. Couldn't find a way through as contact here uh, turned around Jean Baptiste Simonal up at the Druid's hairpin. Second and third, nose to tail towards the end of the race, but it wasn't enough to change second, and they could get nowhere near Timor Bogoslavski, who came through to give Rafael Marciello and Akodis ASP a maiden victory of the season. A great win for the Mercedes team with Audi second, Mercedes third. Rafael Marciello, Timor Bogoslavski, race winners. So let's next go to the uh, podium because the drivers are ready. And uh, now they will be called forward. The SRO team making sure they've got the right drivers, they've got them in the right order. And as soon as the signal is given, out will come the uh, overall top three. And Jules Gounon and Jim Pla will step forward, hopefully, from the room behind the podium. Yeah, out comes Jim. And Jules Gounon perhaps reflecting on what might have been, but he tried hard. He did, and that certainly in the first sprint race, that poor pit stop lost them so much time, having done all the hard yards to get onto the front row of the grid in qualifying. Second place on the podium, Charles Witz, Andries Van Thor, and their Timor Bogoslavski. The day after his birthday, he's a race winner, and Rafael Marciello joins him as they make their way onto the top step of the podium from Akodis ASP. The team will be represented as well. And I think it might be Jerome Polycon who is there. No, I don't think it is. I haven't peered over the railings. Uh, but the trophy is presented. So there you have Jules Gounon and Jim Pla receiving the trophies with a map of Brands Hatch from the MSV chief executive, former Grand Prix racer and Group C racer Jonathan Palmer. And uh, he hands the trophies over to third, then to second, and then to the race winners as uh, there. Charles Witts and Dries Van Thor are all smiles. But Raffaele Marciello, who is still one of the most laid back of Italians, isn't he? Nothing seems to phase him particularly. Just waits his turn on the top step. I've never actually seen him vertical. <laughs> is that laid back? <laughs> well, there, Raffaele and Timor Bogoslavski, they receive their trophies. And uh, now there'll be a big smile, I'm sure. And uh, last but not least, Raffaele it is who gets the trophy. And uh, a very happy man he is too, as the Akodis ASP team will now have its national anthem.
So congratulations to our top three teams. The champagne is about to be sprayed, I suspect, by all of them. But uh, yeah, last year, John, we saw Raffaele Marcello have a lot of bad luck, mechanical problems, for example. But that, it, it, just nothing missed a beat. No, the car has been great all weekend. I mean, he's always a pleasure to watch anyway, but he's been ably supported here through the weekend by Timo Bogoslawski, and that drive that Bogoslawski has just driven in front of us was, I think, one of the finest of his career. Yeah. And, and okay, it was his birthday yesterday. It's a day late, but what a what a what a delight for! And there he is. He's getting all the celebrations he needs both for his birthday yesterday and for a victory here this afternoon. Well, there the celebrations continue as Timo Bogoslawski and uh, Raffaele Marcello can reflect on a great drive. They came so close to the Audi at Imola in the first endurance race, but the tables have been turned in our first weekend in the Sprint Cup, certainly in that second of our two one-hour races. Now, don't forget that within Fanatec GT, we have the global manufacturer's competition uh, because we have Europe, we have Asia, which will start in two weeks, three weeks' time. Uh, we also have Australia and there's America as well. And so Audi Sport is ahead, but only just from Mercedes AMG and it's Porsche in third at this early stage of the season. So the next uh, group of drivers we will look forward to seeing are those in silver, where again in a few moments they will be called forward and uh, for the third place, Nicholas Scherl and Alex Arca for second, Thomas Drouet and Casper Stevenson, but Ulysse de Pau and Pierre-Alexandre Jean taking another victory. Now this is how we look in the Sprint Cup overall at the moment with the two races together, Timo Bogoslowski and Raffaele Marcello, the winners ahead of the winners, the leaders ahead of Charles Wins and Dries Van Thor, Ulysse de Pau, Pierre Alexandre Jean third has out come them our Silvers. Nicolas Scherl and Alex Arca. And once more the top step goes to Pierre Alexandre Jean and Ulysse de Pau. And maybe we kind of have expectations that are too high after that uh, first race overall win but they mucked themselves out as a crew to beat in silver for sure yes very impressive run all weekend by F Corsa Ferrari great to see the Ferrari win the first of these sprint week events and um, standing on the podium having consolidated their silver cup challenge and so the trophies will be presented in a moment as you see the third crew there on the right as you look Alex Arker and Nicholas Scherl Second uh, for the uh, combination of Tom Audrey and Casper Stevenson. But they're the winners, the French-Belgian partnership of Pierre-Alexandre Champ and uh, Ulysse de Pau. And Mathieu Braga from Pirelli hands over the awards for the teams, which are sets of tyres, which are all very valuable to uh, have a free set of boots, especially in a gruelling season like this. National anthem next for the winning team, AF Corsa. Congratulations to AF Corsa, to Ulysse de Pau and Pierre-Alexandre Jean, the drivers, at the end of uh, our second race in Sprint Cup. And uh, they will, in a moment, spray the champagne, no doubt. In fact, Ulysse de Pau looks like he can't wait, can he? Pierre-Alexandre Jean saying, no, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's have a look then at the Silver Cup. Don't forget, there's not just two wins, there's also the pole position points to factor in here for PAJ and UDP. They lead comfortably from Tom Abdrué and Casper Stevenson. Then it's Nicholas Scherl and Alex Arca ahead of Manuel Maldonado and Ethan Simeone. They're fourth after our two races at Brands Hatch. So, great efforts from the Ferrari drivers in silver. They now do let rip with the champagne. Elise de Pau saying that they can celebrate at the end of the day. They couldn't celebrate really between races. And Pierre-Alexandre Jean is rather struggling with this cork. It must have been a long, long time since he won a race. Come on, Pierre-Alexandre. He might have to give up on this and save it. Bang a bottle on the, on the ground. No, can't do it. Rare scene that. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Uh, That's yeah. it. Give it a good old bounce and see if that'll pop it open. We might be here for some time. Um, oh, yeah. I wouldn't want to go on a dinner date with him. You can't do the <laughs> campaign. <laughs> 
have a soft drink, you'll be fine. The next Sprint Cup round, incidentally, is in two weeks' time at Manicor. We'll see whether the Ferrari combination can be as competitive there as they have been here. But we've had two really interesting races to kick off our Fanatec GT Sprint Cup season. And uh, we look forward to more of the same in two weeks' time from Manny Cor. For now, though, from Brands Hatch, thanks for your company. From Gemma Scott in the pits, John Watson and me, David Addison, for now, it's goodbye. Here at Browns Hatch, we are starting lap five. 